Before we get into today's stories, visit dreadsarmy.com to sign up for the Dread Weekly newsletter so you don't miss out on any updates. Also, check out all of the channels in the Dread Network on dreadsarmy.com or in the description below. Thanks for listening. Now let's get to the stories. I've been a park ranger at the Redwood National and State Parks for over 10 years now. I've seen my fair share of oddities. Strange tracks, unexplainable noises, even a few glimpses of creatures that didn't quite fit the usual fauna. But nothing, absolutely nothing prepared me for what I've been experiencing lately. It all began a few weeks ago. I was out on my usual patrol the moon casting long, eerie shadows between the towering redwoods. I'd always loved the forest at night, the way it seemed to come alive with a different kind of energy. But that night, something felt off. The usual chorus of nocturnal creatures was strangely muted, replaced by an unsettling silence. As I made my way along the trail, I noticed something unusual. A series of large footprints unlike any I'd seen before. They were vaguely humanoid, but far too large to be human, and the claws. They were unlike any creature I knew of in these woods. I felt a shiver of unease, but I pushed it aside, attributing it to the strange atmosphere. A few nights later, I saw it. I was on a lake patrol, the forest bathed in an ethereal glow from the full moon. I was nearing the edge of a clearing when I saw a figure in the distance. It was tall easily seven feet, and covered in a thick, matted fur that seemed to absorb the moonlight. Its muscular form was hunched as if it was not used to standing upright. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I took in the sight. Its eyes, glowing in unnatural yellow, met mine, and I felt a chill run down my spine. It was a primal fear, a fear of a predator. And then, as quickly as it had appeared, it was gone leaving only the echo of a low growl and the rustle of undergrowth. I reported what I'd seen to the other rangers, but they dismissed it, attributing it to the shadows and my overactive imagination. But I knew what I'd seen, and I knew it was real. I could still feel its gaze on me, a predator sizing up its prey. A few nights later, my suspicions were confirmed. I was returning from a late patrol when I noticed a light on in one of the cabins. As I approached, I saw them, my fellow rangers carrying a gurney into the cabin. I had no idea why they would do that and especially why they would at night. I asked them about it on my next shift and they all dismissed it and blew me off. It was really weird. I'd been watching the other rangers closely, trying to pick up on any signs of deceit. They're good people, I've worked with them for years, but there's a tension in the air now. A secret being kept. I can't shake the feeling that they know more about the creature than they're letting on. I've been patrolling more frequently, especially at night. I'm drawn to the forest, to the mystery it's hiding. One night I decided to stake out the cabin where I'd seen the gurney. I hid in the underbrush, the cool night air sending shivers down my spine. Hours passed, the forest alive with the sounds of the night. Just as I was about to give up and head back, I saw a light flicker on in the cabin. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched the door slowly open. Two of my fellow rangers emerged, their faces obscured by the darkness. Between them, they were carrying another gurney. My breath hitched as I saw the figure on it, large, covered in a sheet, unmistakably the creature. I watched as they loaded the gurney into a van and drove off, leaving me alone in the darkness. I felt a mix of fear and determination. I knew I had to follow them to uncover the truth. I trailed the van at a safe distance, my mind racing. Where were they taking the creature? Why were they hiding it? The drive seemed to last forever, but finally, we arrived at a secluded facility on the outskirts of the park. I watched as they unloaded the gurney and disappeared inside. I waited until the coast was clear then made my way to the facility. I had to know what was going on. I found a window and peered inside. What I saw made my blood run cold. The creature was there, alive but restrained. 
Scientists in lab coats were gathered around it, taking notes and discussing in hushed tones. I knew then that I had to do something. I couldn't let this continue. I retreated back into the forest, my mind whirling with plans and possibilities. I had to expose the truth for the sake of the creature and the integrity of the park. I've started gathering evidence, documenting everything I can. I've set up a hidden camera, and I'm keeping a close eye on the other rangers and the facility. I'm not sure what I'll find or what I'll do when I find it, but I know I can't stand by and do nothing. I'll keep you updated on what I find. But for now, remember, not everything in the forest is as it seems. And sometimes, the real monsters are not the creatures in the shadows, but the ones hiding in plain sight. I'm writing to share a peculiar incident that occurred to my sister and me last weekend. We reside in the quaint town of Ballycastle, Northern Ireland, and we had ventured out to the local Tesco on a Saturday evening to gather some groceries for the week. As we were returning home, we were traversing one of the lesser-known lanes, and our old car began to falter. It's an ancient thing, but we just don't have the means to replace it yet. We were hoping it would last a bit longer, considering the road we were on was quite secluded, and I certainly didn't fancy the idea of walking a few kilometers in my new stilettos. But alas, fortune wasn't on our side, and the blasted vehicle came to a halt. Thankfully, my sister Maeve managed to guide it to the side of the road as it gave out, so at least we weren't obstructing the path. By the time our car had given up the ghost, it was Saturday night, and our chances of finding a tow service were slim unless we opted for one of those round-the-clock services which cost a small fortune. As for local garages, we have O'Brien's and Gallagher's, but they're both closed on Saturdays. Bally Castle is a small place, after all. I know some might suggest we should have roadside assistance. That would indeed be ideal, but lately we're barely managing to keep the lights on. Regardless, we were stuck, and sometimes you just have to roll with the punches. I knew Maeve didn't want to call anyone we knew for assistance, as it seemed like we were constantly asking for help these days. The pandemic really threw us for a loop, and now all we can find are odd jobs. So we began our trek. Maeve seemed optimistic that a car would pass by eventually, and we wouldn't have to walk the entire distance. She might have been trying to keep my spirits up. As we were walking along the edge of the road, there's a stretch of dense forest before it opens up to a meadow. As we were trudging along next to the forest, I started getting this eerie sensation that something was in there, observing us. I kept glancing towards the trees, and Maeve noticed and asked me what was bothering me. I felt a bit foolish, but I told her, and she chuckled and told me not to fret. It's not like there's anything large enough to harm us where we live. She was correct in terms of wildlife. Badgers, foxes, rabbits, and deer aren't exactly menacing. But I was unnerving myself, considering it might be a person. Which is entirely illogical, given we were in the middle of nowhere, right? Well... I was correct, and there was something there. We both heard a rustling behind us, and we turned around to look. There was something standing in the middle of the road. I asked, is that a person? Because it was tall enough to be one. We couldn't see it clearly, but it didn't resemble a human shape. It was upright on two legs, but the upper body appeared to be triangular. Maeve said, I haven't the foggiest what that is. Let's move. She quickened her pace, which made me quite anxious because she's usually unflappable. So I'm trying to walk faster and my feet are really aching. I keep looking behind us, and even though I never saw it moves, somehow this entity seemed closer every time I glanced back. I was genuinely starting to panic. Maeve must have noticed it was getting closer too. Suddenly she stopped and turned around, shouting, really loud, as if she was trying to frighten it off. I turned around too to see, and this thing was maybe 20 meters behind us. I'm not the best at estimating distances, but right after Maeve shouted, it suddenly moved and its upper body expanded, and I swear on my life, this thing had actual wings. 
These enormous wings unfurled all of a sudden to what seemed to be three meters wide. It then gave a little hop and pushed the wings down and it just took off. There's no other way to describe it. It just launched itself like a bird, even though it was the size of a man. It didn't come toward us, just up and up until it vanished off to the side of the road where the forest was. Maeve said, bloody hell, and I was just speechless. I mean, I've never been so frightened in my life. The only thing I could think was that maybe it was a fallen angel, but that's just my Catholic upbringing, I suppose. And anyway, this thing was dark. Maybe even black, which wouldn't match an angel. I don't really believe in fallen angels. But then again, this thing was man-shaped and man-sized, and it was able to fly. I pulled out my phone right then, ready to call my cousin and plead with her to come get us. We don't really get along, and I didn't want to ask her for help, but I was just terrified. Maeve grabbed my arm and said, We have to keep moving. So here I am trying to dial the number and keep up the pace, and I couldn't get the call to go through. It rang a few times, but the signal must have been weak because it kept dropping the call. I gave up and just focused on walking as fast as I could. Maeve looked behind us real quick and I asked her if the thing had returned. I was too scared to look. She said no, but we kept up our pace. Then we saw some headlights, even though they were going in the wrong direction we wanted to go coming toward us and not heading toward town. Maeve said, Let's cross and flag him down. I guess she was as spooked as me. I knew I would go just about anywhere to get away from here. So we crossed the road, and it was a large truck. Maeve waved her arms and thank God the driver stopped. We got in and Maeve said we just needed to go somewhere, anywhere, it didn't matter where. She just told the driver we broke down. She didn't mention the thing with wings because she probably thought the driver would kick us out thinking we were mad. So the driver was really understanding and said sure, he'd drop us at the next village. I figured if there was any place open we could just hang out and decide what to do from there. We had only been traveling for about five minutes when all of a sudden, the truck's headlights illuminated this thing ahead of us, standing right in the middle of the road. The driver cursed and hit the horn but the thing stayed right in the middle of the road till we got really close. The driver hit his brakes and blew the horn again and the headlight beam shone right on the creature. It was all black except its face, which was gray. It was happening so fast I can't say for sure, but I didn't see a face on it, just red eyes in the headlights right before it took off. I know it was the same thing that had been behind us because it unfolded these big black wings and shot straight up, flying right over the damn windshield. The driver swerved, exclaiming, What was that? And I held on to Maeve with a death grip, afraid we were going to jackknife and crash. The driver got it under control, though. But he must have been pretty shaken up because he pulled off to the side of the road and sat gripping the steering wheel and breathing fast. That's when my sister told him that thing had been following us. The driver had no choice but to believe us then, because he'd seen it with his own eyes. He pulled back on the road and we talked about it all the way to the next village. Sean, the driver, said he'd never seen anything like it before. But a driver friend of his had a similar experience and based on that he thought it was the Mothman. Maeve and I decided together to write you this letter, since you know about stuff like this. No one in our town would ever believe us. Do you know if anyone's ever been hurt by a Mothman? just wondering why it was following us and what would have happened if we hadn't gotten away. Hey there, I've been a big fan of your podcast. I've always been intrigued by the mysteries that lurk beneath the surface of everyday life, and I appreciate that so many people are willing to share their experiences here. Back in my university days in the heart of London, I used to work part-time at a local library. It was a great gig, not only for the extra cash but also because I had unlimited access to all the books I could ever want to read. One evening we were about to close up which involved tidying up the reading areas and preparing the library for the next day. I was working in the history section which had a large window overlooking the park outside. Just outside the window was a small hill that offered a panoramic view of the park. 
I noticed that one of my colleagues had finished his work early and was standing at the top of the hill, seemingly captivated by something. The window was ajar, and I heard him calling out to us, urging us to come and see what he was witnessing. There were about four or five of us working that night, and we all made our way up the hill to see what had caught his attention. It was a clear summer night. The sky was dotted with stars, but one of them seemed too close and was moving in a peculiar manner. At first we thought it might be a plane, but the way it was changing directions was too erratic. It would hover in one spot and then dart across our field of vision. We couldn't gauge its distance, but we were certain that no conventional aircraft could perform such maneuvers. After observing it for about five minutes, we tried to convince ourselves that it was some sort of optical illusion. We returned to the library to finish our closing duties. Once we were done, we went back up the hill to see if the object was still there. It was, and it seemed to be either brighter or closer. At this point, we decided to stick around and observe this anomaly. Some of us went back inside to grab some snacks while the rest of us sat on the hill, watching the object dart across the sky, hover in place, and drift slowly in different directions. It was unlike anything we had ever seen, and we all agreed that it seemed to be getting closer. Around the time our friends returned with the snacks, the object's light started to spiral. It was definitely getting closer and seemed to be heading towards the library. But then, it abruptly stopped in mid-air. Its light grew larger and larger. It seemed to be descending rapidly, but then it halted, changed directions entirely, and accelerated at an incredible speed in the opposite direction. We were spellbound. We ate our snacks and for some inexplicable reason decided to chase after the object to get a better look. We sprinted down the hill and across the park towards the light. It veered over the trees on the edge of the park and we followed it. The glow from the object was bright enough to illuminate the trees so we didn't have to worry about stumbling over roots or undergrowth. We were all excited and shouting out theories about what it could be but I think we were also trying to mask our nervousness. Suddenly the object stopped and descended slightly above us, not directly overhead but close enough to startle us. It then just hovered there. It was low enough now that we could see five red circles on its underside. There were two circles positioned above three others, forming a trapezoid shape. It was emitting a loud, pulsating sound. After hovering for a couple of minutes, the light switched off, and it went completely silent. We could still see the silhouette of the object, a stark blackness against the night sky. After a few more minutes of hovering, it shot off over the horizon with the five red lights at the rear. It moved with the speed of a bullet, disappearing over the horizon in a matter of seconds. In the darkness, it resembled a short, stout triangle. Then, there was nothing. We were all panting from the chase. As we stood there trying to comprehend what we had just witnessed, two fighter jets roared overhead at an extremely low altitude. A few minutes later, we saw multiple military aircraft and helicopters flying in the direction where the lights had disappeared. At that point, we all silently agreed to return to the library. Once we were back inside, we decided that regardless of what we had seen, whether it was some sort of military experiment or something truly bizarre, we didn't want to draw attention to ourselves. We certainly didn't want to mention it to our employer. So we all agreed not to discuss it. Of course, there was no mention of the incident on the news or anywhere else. I've thought about it often over the years. I still keep in touch with a couple of the guys I was with that night, and we all have the same recollection of what happened. I doubt we'll ever get any definitive answers about all the covert operations that must be happening out there. But I kind of hope to witness something like that again. I find myself constantly scanning the night sky, just in case. I was never one to believe in extraterrestrial life, but I didn't dismiss it either. I would spend hours on the internet reading about UFO sightings, watching documentaries about alien encounters. It was all just a form of amusement for me. 
But let me tell you, once you witness something inexplicable, it's no longer a game. It's a memory that gnaws at your sanity. And no matter how much you implore people to trust you, even you can't persuade yourself you sound anything other than delusional. I was 19 years old the first time my roommates left me alone in our apartment for an entire week. While to most people my age this would have sounded like a dream come true, I was petrified. Begged them to postpone their trip even. You see, I lived in a high-rise in the heart of New York City, and while it was bustling and vibrant during the day, I always found myself extremely anxious at night. There were windows everywhere and no way of knowing what was lurking behind them in the darkness. Not to mention, the city lights oftentimes were so bright that they made it exceptionally difficult to see anything outside at night. Of course, this did not stop things on the outside from looking into my apartment. And though I never particularly caught anything peering through my windows, oh, and did I mention the entire wall of my living room was made up of floor-to-ceiling windows? Go figure. The only thing that kept me somewhat calm while alone at night was my cat, Whiskers. He was a particularly alert feline and would cause a commotion anytime he sensed something near the apartment. This is why, that Tuesday evening when my roommates were gone and Whiskers started acting unusually agitated, I knew something was off. I tried to reassure myself at first. Chances are, the thing setting Whiskers off could have been a pigeon, a rat, or maybe even a stray cat on the fire escape. These were way more logical and preferable to whatever the hell was actually out there that night. Being as adult as I possibly could, I told Whiskers to quiet down and even went as far as putting him in my roommate's room for a few minutes to get him to calm down. With Whiskers in the room and silenced from his usual meowing, an eerie quietness fell over the apartment, and that's when I first heard it. This strange, intermittent humming sound. It didn't seem to come at regular intervals. It was random, varying in tone and duration. Almost how you hear spacecrafts hum in old sci-fi movies. I spent the next five minutes combing through the apartment, searching for the source of the humming noise. But the more I searched, the less hope I had for finding it, and the more anxious I became. The last place I had to check off of my search was the living room, and when I heard the humming coming from beyond the window, outside of the apartment, I could hardly breathe. My terror overtook me, and I sprinted to let Whiskers out of the room. That's when I saw it. It came zooming into view, as if having followed me on the outside of the apartment, from the living room window to the balcony. The city lights illuminated it, and I cannot make up what I saw even if I wanted to. A metallic disc-shaped object hovering in the air, moving faster than any drone should be capable of. It had a large, round body with pulsating lights, but no visible propellers that I could see. Its surface was smooth and shiny, and it continued making those same eerie humming noises, but now even louder than before. I let out the most blood-curdling scream and flung open the door to my roommate's room. Whiskers sprung into action, charging the window, and meowing more aggressively than he ever has before. The hair on his body was raised, his paws slammed into the glass, and if there were no barrier between the two, I'm confident Whiskers would have tried to attack that thing. The object seemed startled by Whiskers' appearance and darted back and forth across the balcony as if to evade his advancements. I'm not sure how I worked up the courage to do what I did next, but it was as though my mind weren't in control of my body. I sprinted towards the window and grabbed Whisker's collar, bringing me face to face with the object. It darted towards the window in an attempt to approach, at which point I was almost certain I'd have a fatal heart attack. I stumbled backwards, Whisker's following closely behind, and could only manage to make my legs work for 15 seconds more as I threw myself into my room. I slammed the door and locked it, but even that wasn't providing the security it needed to. I had a window in my room and could not bear to be anywhere near it. So naturally, I huddled Whiskers and I inside my small closet and did not hesitate to dial 911. To cut to the chase, all but one of the police officers who'd heard a story of a similar sighting did not believe me about the encounter. And as the story goes, 
There was absolutely no evidence, not even a trace in the night sky to support my case. But honestly, their belief wasn't what I needed. All I needed was to never be alone in that apartment again, which I accomplished when I had the sudden urge to transfer to a college far away in the countryside. I typically refrain from bringing up the story nowadays, mainly because I don't indulge in reliving the experience. But no matter how far away I am from that dreaded object, it still seems to find a way to haunt me, even if now only in my dreams. I'm sending in my encounter story from Oregon. My name is Samuel, and about five years ago I was a bachelor living just outside of Bend, Oregon. Anyone familiar with that area probably knows about the Deschutes National Forest nearby, as well as several additional state parks. I had moved to Bend from New York to follow my dream of becoming a wildlife photographer, but it ended up being more challenging than I thought. I was living in a small cabin in a remote area, and my nearest neighbor was actually a lumber mill, so I didn't have anyone to interact with regularly. Sometimes I would call my brother back home to chat, he was married with a few kids of his own, or I'd spend a while talking to the delivery guy, usually an older man named Hank who would come down my long driveway to deliver packages. With a little less than a month to go until I could move back home, autumn started creeping up. The leaves were changing colors and falling, and after a few days I was able to calm down and enjoy the peace. So one evening I was packing up the majority of my studio except for necessities. The cabin was surrounded by fir trees, so we were covered in shade relatively early in the evening, and it also got dark faster in our area. I had just started putting away a set of expensive camera equipment when I heard what sounded like a branch hitting a window. I stopped to listen, but I found it hard to concentrate as my dog, Max, started barking. I walked over to quiet him down and heard the sound again a little thudding sound like a branch hitting glass and bouncing off. It was coming from the direction of the living room. Immediately I stiffened up. After all, I was living alone in this cabin with a dog, in an area I didn't really like. The nearest person would, hopefully, respond if I needed. The lights were off in the living room, so I just stuck my head into the room and looked at the windows quickly. As I glanced around, a branch bounced off the far window and I jerked back into the studio. Probably just a deer playing around, I tried to convince myself, but knew there weren't any deer in the area. Max, my dog, didn't seem bothered by what was happening and I went back to him, petting him as if he was the one who needed comforting. For a few minutes it was quiet, and I was just starting to catch my breath when I heard the garage door rattle. It was one of those big wooden doors that you have to pull down over the carport. I ran to the studio window and looked out into the driveway where the light clearly outlined something walking around. At first I thought I was looking at someone in a Halloween costume. It looked like a Bigfoot getup, but I realized quickly that it was too realistic, not loose like I would expect a costume to be. What I was looking at was a large ape-like creature standing on its hind legs. I could only watch as it moved around the side of the garage and made another banging sound. It must have been hitting the side of the garage for some reason. As soon as I couldn't see it anymore, I went and grabbed Max and headed upstairs where I could look down on the front yard out of the bedroom window. We stayed up there for maybe 10 minutes before I heard a vehicle come down the driveway. It was the delivery truck, with headlights on, and I held Max tightly as I ran back downstairs to meet Hank. I didn't open the screen door right away and he looked confused, waiting on the porch. Hey, I said to him breathlessly, and then explained what had happened. He listened without interrupting, only turning once to look at the garage door, which was closed. When I finished, he stepped off the porch and went to the garage. I warned him to be careful. He took his phone out, took a few photos and came back to the house to show me through the screen door. The photos were of footprints. I can only describe them as really big footprints. If I spread my hand out, they were larger than that and five-toed. Hank could tell how freaked out I was and started to explain to me about the supposed Bigfoot sightings in the area. I hadn't heard of them before. This wasn't any kind of legend I'd heard back home. 
He told me that there were a few reports every year and they were really similar to mine. Bigfoot coming to remote houses and messing with things. Never hurting anyone, but always doing something to scare people. The banging on the garage and throwing branches was pretty standard. He told me that if I hadn't gone upstairs, I probably would have seen it looking through the first floor windows at me. All I can say is, I'm happy I didn't. I probably would have had a heart attack. A few weeks later, as planned, I moved back east to a much more populated area about 10 minutes away from my brother. Max is seven now, and every now and then I wonder if I should tell him this story when he's older. But I think he's like me, and it would probably mess with him more than help. Anyway, there is no reason for him to really know about it. My dream is still in Oregon and will probably stay there. I often wonder if it's encountered anything. You know, people tend to romanticize the life of a park ranger. They envision us basking in the glory of nature surrounded by picturesque vistas and charming wildlife. Well, let me set the record straight. Sure, there are days of tranquility and peace, but it's not all postcard perfect scenes. The job comes with its fair share of eerie shadows and spine-tingling mysteries, especially if you're like me, with a curiosity that tends to bite back. A few years back, during my tenure as a ranger, I began to notice something peculiar within our park. Nestled away from the beaten paths and the well-trodden trails, about two miles deep into the forest, was an ancient-looking building. It was a decrepit structure, hidden under a blanket of thick overgrowth, surrounded by a rusty barbed wire fence. The building was conspicuously absent from any of our official maps, and trust me, I checked them all. This enigma was a splinter in my mind, nagging me with its existence. Eager for answers, I brought up the topic with my fellow rangers. I expected them to share my curiosity, my concern, but all I received were dismissive shrugs. Their casual responses echoed the same sentiment. Don't trouble yourself over it, they decries. Leave it alone. But their indifference clashed with my nature. I've always been the kind of guy who dives headfirst into mysteries, relishing the thrill of the unknown, and this cryptic building was a riddle I couldn't ignore. My intrigue escalated to an all-time high one moonless night. While I was on patrol, following the same route I'd taken a hundred times before, something unusual caught my eye. A behemoth of a tractor trailer, pitch black and intimidating, rolled up to the mysterious building. Four figures, their features hidden under heavy, dark clothing, exited the vehicle. They busied themselves unloading an unknown cargo into the back of the building. The sight was as intriguing as it was suspicious, but the distance and darkness made it impossible to discern what they were transporting. My curiosity was stirred into a frenzied whirlpool, the mystery deepening with each passing moment. The next morning, I attempted to broach the subject with the senior ranger, hoping that he, with his years of experience, would shed some light on the matter. Yet, much to my dismay, he brushed off my concerns, chalking it up to an overactive imagination. His words were a proverbial slap to my face, a cold dismissal of my instincts. But that didn't discourage me. If anything, it steeled my resolve. I wanted answers, and I was hell-bent on finding them. Weeks turned into months, and my vigilance over that forsaken building didn't waver. More suspicious activities, more covert meetings under the cloak of night. The more I tried to unearth the truth, the more hostility I faced from my superiors. It reached a boiling point when they presented me with an ultimatum, abandon my investigation or face severe consequences. You see, I'm not the kind of man who can be bullied into submission. My curiosity, my innate desire for justice, they were forces I couldn't ignore. But my tenacity came at a steep price. I was fired, stripped of my ranger's badge, my years of faithful service disregarded without a second thought. If given the chance, though, I wouldn't change a thing. There are things in this world that outweigh the security of a job, and to me, uncovering the truth behind that isolated building was one of them. Today. 
I'm no longer a park ranger. The uniform is gone, but the spirit remains. This mystery, it's far from solved. It's not over, not by a long shot. I may not know what's happening in that forsaken building, but I'll unearth its secrets. I owe it to myself and to the park I once dedicated my life to safeguard. So here's to hoping luck is on my side. And if you don't hear from me again, well, just know that I've stumbled onto something I was never meant to discover. I didn't close my coffee shop because the business was failing. I didn't close it because my customers left or because the bakery section got a bad reputation. Nothing like that happened. I was successful, honestly. I was happy and successful, a combination that I thought was impossible for a very long time. You've got a shop like mine in U-Town too, I bet. The local coffee place the college kids go to. They all swear it's better than the big brand's coffee even though the truth is they just like the quiet atmosphere. Every town's got one. Except for ours, I guess. You see, my shop stopped being about coffee. If I was within three blocks of that building, all I could think about was the thing I saw out back. The thing in the dumpster. The thing that started as a man but quickly became something else. I closed up alone most nights. The shop would shut down for four hours before the baker came in to prep that morning's menu. I'd come back around dawn and business would start soon thereafter. This particular night, I'd gathered up the trash and was headed out back to the dumpster. It was my last task before locking up. When I saw the black lid was thrown back, I suspected the worst. Well, it had been the worst up until that point. The local homeless would sometimes rummage through our trash, searching for anything of value. I didn't blame them necessarily, but we didn't throw out much food, and we didn't throw out recyclables, so their searching was more often a nuisance than it was rewarding. Regardless of whether or not I offered them a cup of coffee, they never took the eviction well. When I heard something rummaging inside of the industrial-sized green metal frame, I prepared myself for that conversation. Hey! I called out. There's better stuff inside. Instead of responding, whoever was ducking inside the dumpster went quiet. They went still, as if I wouldn't eventually see them as I approached the structure. The closer I got, the more I realized how bad they were at hiding. I could still them breathing, heavy and labored. It sounded like something was obstructing their airway. Maybe they were sick. I didn't know. The low rumble of their breath did make me slow down, though. When I was finally close enough to see over the lip of the dumpster, I was more nervous than anything. I did my part to help the people in my community, but I wasn't eager to get sick myself. Right before I looked over the edge, the stranger reached out. A human-like hand, four fingers and one thumb, curled over the lip of the dumpster. The nails were long and dark, even in the poor nighttime light. Hair curled on the man's wrist and ran down to his knuckles. Although the fingers were bare, they looked swollen and inflamed. The coloration on his nails made me guess that they were infected somehow. I backed up. I stopped talking. Suddenly the garbage in my hands wasn't terribly important. The next to rise over the edge of that dumpster wasn't the disease-ridden face I was expecting. I watched as the head of a dog climbed into sight. It didn't make sense, but that's what it was. A dog's head at the top of this thing's hairy shoulders. Its maw was long. Yellow teeth peeped out from between its curled lips. Its ears were tall like a wolf's or a fox's, and they were both pinned back against its head. I couldn't understand what it was. I still can't wrap my head around it, not really. I just know in that moment, I was the smallest thing on the face of the planet and I was standing in the path of a giant. It climbed one leg after another out of the dumpster and hopped to the ground. It tripped, fell onto its side with a nearly comical display of clumsiness. It was thin, starving probably. That explained the look in its eyes too. But I couldn't expect it to be weak or slow, even with starvation holding it back. It was taller than me by nearly two feet. 
I could imagine how long its stride was and how quickly it could move it dropped onto all fours instead of standing upright. I couldn't outrun something like that, but I didn't want to stand there and face it either. I dropped the trash, splitting open one of the bags and turned to flee back into the building. I heard the creature leap forward. I grit my teeth, expecting its fangs to sink into my back. That didn't happen. I reached the door safely, ducked inside and locked it shut. Looking out the window, I could still see it. It was sniffing through the trash bag, chewing on a discarded paper cup. I was wrong, I realized. Starvation had saved me. Chewing its way through the trash was a lot easier than coming after me. I called both the police and animal control. Only animal control agreed to investigate the scene. By the time I could hear their tires rolling down the street, the monster was gone. Its ears had perked up long before mine. It glanced briefly at the window I was staring through and then it disappeared. It ran off, disappearing somewhere in town. They told me it was a bear or a dog that I'd seen. I wasn't in any state to argue with them, but I know that wasn't some ordinary animal, and I couldn't get it out of my mind after that. So the coffee shop had to go. I don't tell this story often either. It isn't something I enjoy sharing. But please, if you hear something unseen rummaging through your trash, maybe investigate those sounds with more than garbage in your hands. Skinwalkers are shapeshifters. They can turn into any animal they want to, which is why it's so hard to believe in them. The main idea of this creature is to be feared for what they may or may not do. Little is known about these creatures, but many stories are told around the southwest states here in the United States. One particular incident was told to me by my own great-grandmother. It was an experience she had when she was 11 or 12, in the early 1930s. She said that it was during the Great Depression which, as you would imagine, was a very depressing time. She was helping her father on the farm, lifting bales of hay and feeding the cattle. She said her feet had blisters and her hands had sores from all the physical labor. If only kids today knew. She told me it was around 4 p.m. in the summer. Her father was already back inside getting ready for dinner and she was still outside. She was pretty irritated that all her brothers had gone back in. That's when something strange happened. The sun began to get really small in the sky, and it grew bigger and eventually disappeared behind the clouds. This left the sky very gray, and she began to fear for herself. The next thing, one of the cattle beside her began going crazy, running around and roaring, greatly agitated. It scared the heck out of her. She had no experience calming animals. The next thing she said, the cow ran behind some bushes, then emerged as a sheep but covered in blood and with the face of a wolf. My great-grandmother told me she stood there absolutely petrified watching this sheep emerge, but not a sheep, something else, something dark and demonic. I remember she broke down as she explained her story even all these years later. My great-grandmother, now nearing 90, reliving such a trauma from many years before, it was deeply moving. It showed me that trauma and pain never leave our memory. She explained that the sheep continued running around the field, scaring the cattle, maiming several of them. It looked totally crazed and bloodthirsty. The next thing she told me was that her own father came out with the family shotgun and attempted to shoot the sheep, but it disappeared behind the bushes, never coming out. When they checked the bushes, nothing was there except some dried blood and wool. My great-grandmother said her father moved the entire family after the incident and regularly used blessed salt and holy water all over the farm. My great-grandmother was very into supernatural and paranormal events. She did a great deal of research on the incident and is convinced she saw a shapeshifter. I mean, it would make a lot of sense, as many of the characteristics of shapeshifters are fulfilled in my great-grandmother's description. This story has fascinated me from childhood to the age of 35 today. I feel compelled to put pen to paper and share this recollection of my great-grandmother's tale with as many people as possible. I feel I owe it to her. 
No child deserved to see such horror. That is what my great-grandmother saw. So if you are reading this, please tell me something about them. Have they always existed? How do we get rid of them? What do they do? What are they capable of? Are they all evil? I mean, are there good shapeshifters? I have so many questions, but I am committed to researching this, and I hope you can provide me with many answers. If not for me, then for my great-grandmother. Thank you for reading. I'm a hobbyist and a paranormal investigator. I wanted to take some time and share with you an encounter story that I've recently come to know from a man in the state of Alabama. This man had an encounter near his home. He claims it was a reptilian that he said was about 10 feet tall and it left three claw marks on the hood of his truck in a fierce showdown. It apparently tried to kill the man but was unsuccessful. He, however, was successful in getting away. What made this the scariest of all is that there were other witnesses to this strange event. The descriptions given by the two who saw the same thing as the man were the same. The two witnesses were his wife and older son. They were all terrified by what he saw that afternoon. He claimed that this thing climbed right out of the swamps and went right for him. They kind of had a brawl and he shot at this thing multiple times, trying to get it to go away. The man deeply admitted to being terrified of what he saw, and if this thing wanted to kill him, it could have easily done so. This reptilian cryptid, as described by the witnesses, was around 10 feet tall, grayish to green scaly skinned, sharp teeth in its mouth, large hands with three claws each, and long protruding spikes all over its back with a long tail covered in barbs or thorns. Its eyes were red with yellow-like slits for pupils. It looked extremely angry. The thing was supposedly able to climb trees and also walked around on two legs like a man would, very comfortably. The witness says that the thing had a horrible, sickening smell that emitted from it. You could smell it before it even showed up. It smelled bad. The mom and son just kept saying how horrible the smell was and they are praying to never have another encounter with whatever this was. The witness was so terrified after the incident that he and his family moved away from the area. The family now lives in northern Florida with their relatives in order to avoid that property and area altogether. When I spoke to the witness, he claimed there are a lot of swamplands that surrounded that specific county. Also, lots of deer, lots of hunting. He said the surrounding county is very rural and a lot of people like to hunt there. He now prefers living in northern Florida. He doesn't want another reptilian encounter experience. He doesn't want to be that close to those swamps ever again, especially after his family had their very first and hopefully only encounter. The man also wants to be clear that what he saw was not a human in a suit, but something else. Something dark. Something from another world. When they were definitely being attacked, he also admits that he got a look at the creature. The man said that his wife described it exactly the way he did. It was hideous. She was hiding inside, afraid of what might happen if she stepped outside and was unsure of what to do. She said she also smelled a foul odor before she ever saw the creature. And even when she saw it, and after it disappeared, her description of its claws was identical to her husband's description. She described them as three claws that resembled retractable knives coming out of each hand. It was also reported to have been making a loud shrieking noise as it approached. She said her husband is lucky that this thing let him get away. If anyone else has had a sighting or an encounter story that you know regarding something like this, I'd appreciate any information you could share with me. Because here, there is something very strange going on. And because we don't have photographic evidence, at least not yet, we won't be able to prove this thing exists, which we're wanting to do. So if you ever come across this thing, please don't hesitate to share it here so I can know more. Thank you. Being a ranger isn't always easy. Sure, I get to see some of the most beautiful scenery in the country and talk to people from all walks of life. 
In addition, it is a great career for someone like me who just loves being outdoors. However, dealing with those who are uninformed and do not understand the park rules or how our park society actually works can be difficult at times. And a lot of them don't even realize that the rules are there to protect them from things they couldn't even imagine. I once read something on a Reddit thread about how Stephen King must have had a park ranger on retainer to get story ideas. While I highly doubt that it is true, we do see stuff that I bet most horror writers couldn't even dream of. One thing that never fails to freak me out, no matter how many times it happens, and it is way more often than you would think, is when you come across something that has absolutely no right to be there, and you have no clue how it could have possibly gotten there. Staircases being discovered, okay, you might think at some point there must have been a building many years ago, and all that's left is the stairs. The only issue being that the trees surrounding the structure are hundreds of years old, and the stairs are not. So there couldn't possibly have been any building there, and none of the trees are damaged, and there is no route or trail leading up to the area for some big-time practical joker to plant it there for some YouTube show. They're just there. The same with abandoned cars. They appear in areas that have been looked at many times before, maybe on foot or with an ARV, but again there is no way a truck, camper van, etc. could have gotten there. Yet we find them sometimes in a state of decay, showing the vehicle had been there for years, when in reality, that area had been checked and reported back on only a few days ago. Sometimes when we check, the vehicles are registered to people who have been missing for years. Other times, they just don't seem to exist in the system. And once in a while, we find a person sometimes alive, other times just a body. Sometimes they actually are hikers or hunters who've lost their way, and other times they are not. We have found people wandering around in places that had been checked only a few hours before, looking like they've been lost for days. When we finally manage to convince them that we are the good guys and want to help, we find that they've been missing for days and weeks and are not even from the US, let alone this area. The scariest part is that they have no idea how they got there. These are ordinary people who, at one moment, are sitting at a desk in Germany. The next thing you know, it's three weeks later and they're here in America, having no idea how they ended up here. You won't find these sorts of reports on your local news, so don't bother looking. We take them straight to a government building and, well, they deal with it. So next time you are hiking and you've been doing it for years, and a ranger tells you not to go somewhere or you're hunting, and they tell you to avoid a certain area, do what they say. We are not being a pain and trying to ruin your day. We are looking after you because something is out there, dumping bodies, cars, even people into our forests and parks. If something or someone is doing that, then maybe just maybe they are also taking things. And the hikers that go missing just maybe they were not dragged off by a bear or fell down a ravine and were eaten. Maybe they'll turn up somewhere in the middle of the desert in another country, and that country's government will come along and deal with them. And from what I've seen from the few moments I've spent in the company of one of those people, you do not want that to be you. I don't know if it's exclusive to our corner of the United States, but I do know my division within the Park Service is a bit untraditional. We help keep the parks clean, of course. We route out the teenagers that get too rowdy and we cooperate with the fire department when lightning strikes the wrong tree. But we have another responsibility. It's a team of myself and 13 others. There's an official name for us that I can't share, but amongst ourselves we're called the Finders. What we do is find the things that no one in their right mind wants to look for. Scary things do live in the national parks. Scary things live everywhere, as a matter of fact. It's thanks to the United States government that in our areas, we can preserve the beautiful sides of nature while stopping the spread of her nastier inhabitants. There's a lick of truth in a lot of the weird stories that come out of these parks. I've got a story of my own. Unfortunately, this story does start with tragedy. 
I think the greatest lessons all begin with something of that scope. Something has to be lost for something to be learned. Anyway, a hiker had gone missing. This was roughly 15 years ago. We'd recovered their campsite, but there wasn't any sign of the individual in question. More mysteriously, their tent was recovered some 100 yards from the campsite itself. The structure was in ruins, shredded into thin strips of fabric. The metal beams that formed its shape were bent and broken. Theories were rampant regarding how the tent could have traveled so far. Those of us in the finders knew it was likely that something had dragged it. The wind hadn't been strong enough to move the tent that far, let alone to tie the metal stakes into knots. Hopes of finding the hiker in one piece were fizzling out. The rest of the park service was busy looking for them while we were tasked with finding whatever could have taken her. We had our theories, of course. I'm sure by now you've heard stories about the strange creatures living in our national parks. Draw one of their names out of a hat, and we likely considered them a suspect. We needed to be more concerned with evidence than theories, though. There weren't any footprints or drag marks leading out of the campsite although some unreliable prints had been picked up leading into the space. They were larger than the hikers by a large margin, but the ground had been too hard that day to form a reliable cast. We were working off of indentations in the grass and leaves. After scouring the ground and turning up empty-handed, we looked up. We found fur in the trees, oddly enough, and a branch some twenty feet above the campground that had recently been broken. Quickly, one of our theories jumped ahead of the pack. We traced a line from the campsite to the place where the tent was recovered. We checked the trees all along that path. More broken branches and in one case a torn piece of fabric likely ripped from our missing hiker. Whatever had taken them had grabbed them, tent and all, carried them into the trees, and then leaped from branch to branch. It sounded impossible. What could be so strong and so nimble? We were determined to find out. When the rest of the park service discovered the hiker, surprisingly in stable condition, we had another point to investigate. The other team cleared out quickly, more concerned with the hiker's well-being than with our monster hunt. But we noticed it right away. The details they had missed. They had pulled her out of a den. The area smelled faintly of urine and animal hide. We could see three locations where the brush had been gathered and pressed flat into makeshift beds. There was a mound of earth where something had recently been dug up and buried. Before we had any more time to investigate, the creatures who lived there came home. There was a knocking on a nearby tree. How a man might knock on his own door when he's left the key inside. When we looked, we saw a flash of broad shoulders and fur diving deeper into the woods. There a howl came from the opposite direction. We spun around, trying to chase the furry shapes in the trees with our eyes. When the next sound came from above us, we froze. It was the whine of wood bending beyond its limit. We knew what that meant. At least one of them was above us. We looked up to see massive feet folded around one of the branches. The man-shaped beast was hunched on the branch, looking down at us with an open mouth and wide eyes. We sprayed bear spray into the wind and started to run. We hoped it would be enough to disorient whatever we had seen. Sure enough, it worked. We safely arrived back at our local office and filed a report about our encounter. We made plans to journey back into the woods and to investigate the creatures, to determine why they had attacked. When we got back, they weren't there. They tossed their own nest, unburied whatever had been hidden in the mound, and disappeared. That's why this story gets told, even though it might not have the most action and it might not be the most fun. I tell this story because we still don't have the answers. We're still scratching our head about it all these years later. That's our responsibility, you know? We're the ones who find the answers. I tell this story because it's the one that ends with a warning. And if I don't warn you, there's a chance that no one will. If you're out in the woods, keep your head on a swivel. Secure your perimeter and remember to look up. Alright, 
Here we go. I was born and raised in California, but my folks were originally from Maine. They moved to the West Coast for work shortly before tying the knot. I came into the picture about a year later. So every year we'd pack up the car and head back to Maine to hang out with my grandparents for a couple of weeks. Now, I've always been a fan of the hustle and bustle of city life, so the quiet countryside of Maine where my grandparents lived was a bit of a change for me. They were near the Canadian border, living in this snug little farmhouse that got pretty cramped when we all crammed in there, especially when my little brother and sister were born. The one year I didn't make it to Maine was when I was a junior in high school. I got to go to Japan for a school exchange program. And wouldn't you know it, my granddad, who we affectionately called Gramps, passed away about a month later. The rest of my family was there, so I felt comfort knowing they were with him towards the end. A week after Gramps' passing, we found ourselves driving back to Maine for the funeral. It was a long nine-hour drive, and I was with my brother in our car, while my sister tagged along with our parents. We got there late in the evening, had a home-cooked meal by Grams, and then pretty much everyone just crashed from the journey. The next day was the funeral. There was a small service at the local church that Gramps used to go to, and then the burial at the town cemetery, a good half-hour drive from Grams' house. Afterwards, Grams had folks over for a little get-together and lunch. I met many of their friends from around the area, and while they were a bit different from the city folks I was used to, everyone was genuinely nice. The drive and the funeral had taken a toll on me and my siblings, so after lunch we decided to go outside and get some fresh air. Grams and Gramps had a bit over 10 acres of land that led up to a pretty steep hill, not quite a mountain but close enough. It was filled with pine trees and looked really dense. Gramps had an old hunting cabin somewhere up there, and we decided to hike up to it for old time's sake. We hadn't been to the cabin since we were kids, so finding it was a bit of an adventure. It looked like Gramps hadn't been there in a while, but we ended up just chilling on the ground underneath the cabin, reminiscing about the good times with Gramps. We didn't always see eye to eye as siblings, but Gramps' passing made us put our differences aside. As my brother Jake was chatting about wanting to visit Japan like I did, we heard this weird thump. We looked around, puzzled, but then everything went quiet again and we resumed our conversation. But then bam, 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 four more thumps in quick succession. To me it sounded like rocks being thrown against trees. My sister Lucy stood up immediately, saying she wanted to head back to the house. I could tell she was a little spooked. We were about a 15-minute walk deep into the woods. I tried to stay cool as I got up, but I noticed that the woods were eerily quiet. No chirping of birds or rustling of squirrels, which is usually a sign of a larger predator nearby. Grants taught us that when we were kids, but I wasn't sure if Jake or Lucy remembered. Trying to keep Lucy calm, I started guiding us back the way we came all the while chattering about anything and everything I could think of. Jake was starting to look a bit uneasy too. Then he stopped dead in his tracks, pointed and said, Moose? But it sounded more like a question than a statement. What he was pointing at was hunched over and a dark brown color. Not like any moose I'd ever seen before. It was massive, bigger than a horse for sure. And as we watched it, the creature stood up. I realized it was standing on two legs and was looking right at us. But instead of the long snout and antlers I was expecting, the face was eerily human-like. Still covered in fur but with a human nose and ears. It was maybe 200 feet away. Lucy took off running without a second thought and Jake and I were right behind her. We sprinted back to the house and burst through the front door. Grams must have seen us from the window because she immediately asked us what was wrong. Lucy was too shaken to speak, but I tried my best to explain what we saw, even though I knew it sounded absolutely bonkers. To my surprise, Grams didn't seem phased at all. She mentioned that Gramps used to talk about seeing those things in the woods. Apparently there were a few of them, but they usually kept to the deeper parts of the hill. She mused, I wonder if they knew he's gone and came down to pay their respects. 
As crazy as it sounded at the time, as I've grown older, I find myself wondering the same thing. They've been here for as long as I can remember. They were here when my mother was a child. They were here when her mother was a child. The little things in the woods. I didn't believe them for the longest time. I thought the glimpses I'd seen in my youth were the result of childish fantasy. They became very real for me once I started in these woods. Once the woods became my business, my profession, and my very way of life, the trees opened up little secrets for me. They are the forest's oldest secrets. Thieves and monsters. Cruel and venomous. They're snakes on two feet. They're wasps that can only fly as far as they can fall, but their stingers still find you all the same. The first time I saw them, I mean really saw them. I thought I was dreaming. I thought I was having a stroke brought on by too many hours in the sun. I never did drink enough water to make up for my long treks through the wilderness. I saw them at the riverside and I mistook them for beavers. How could I have known that they were only wearing those animals as coats? I watched a while, leaned forward from my shaded spot beneath the trees. When I saw pale, crooked fingers peek out from the folds in the animal hide, shakily aiming a ladle for the flow of the roaring water, I think I would have gasped. Was it not for the twig that broke beneath my heel and sent an icicle of dread into my heart? The things didn't look back. They knew they were spotted and they didn't like it. They ran, scurrying along the river until they disappeared into the reeds. I sat there for a while, in the place where my cover had been blown. Had I really seen five tiny fingers come out of that animal? Or was it the product of my adult imagination? Stress and a lack of nutrition could have led to something like that, right? No, I decided. I'd seen that little hand. When I stood up from the knoll overlooking the river, I knew that I was going to see more. I wanted to learn everything I could about those creatures. The first person I called was my mother. She, much to my surprise, didn't want to talk about them. I pushed and pried for information. Eventually, she cracked. I learned that they used to steal tools and livestock from the communities nearby. Hammers and chickens would go missing, with little footprints left behind in the dirt. How had no one captured them? Why weren't there any pictures online? I learned that there were actually... Look around long enough and I guess you can really find anything on the internet. It wasn't enough to satisfy me though. I wanted to see them in person. I wanted to know exactly what I had discovered. I stalked that river for weeks. Went a mad, I think. Eventually, I was there more often than not smelling of fresh water and mossy stone. I'd wish I could call it my typical hyperfixation. It was a little different then, a little overboard. I thought I was chasing something magical. Maybe I was trying to get back in touch with my childhood self. I guess I was bored with my career by then. Either way, if I had known anything tangible about the creatures I was facing, I would have turned back. I found a cave. It easily could have been mistaken for an animal den. I was lucky to know what to look for. The tiny, tightly knit footprints almost looked feline. I think they designed it that way. It was the track pattern that was off. The rhythm told me that the creatures stood upright. A peek inside with my flashlight caught bits of silver and rust. Spoons and forks were hanging from twine, seemingly repurposed into shovels and rakes. They were mounted like tools might be mounted in a shed. I thought to creep in closer, to crawl into the cave's mouth on my hands and knees. It was hardly big enough for a dog to squeeze through. But then my flashlight caught something else. The shiver of eyes, reflective like a cat's. Small and beady, but shaped all wrong. They scanned me left to right, then one pair turned into two and two pairs turned into three. There were a half dozen little faces staring back at me before long. By then, I couldn't run. I was transfixed. I was terrified. But I was so close to the thing I'd been hunting that I could practically feel the warmth of success pumping through my veins. Then they ran at me. They scurried like rats. 
The light from outside the caves crested on their faces and revealed their gnarled expressions. Their skin looked like leather. Their wrinkles looked cut from the bark of a tree. They were hard and evil-looking little creatures. And as they ran, they snarled. They screamed. Not one of them was taller than my knee, but I wasn't interested in fighting off the pack. I'd gotten what I'd came for. I'd found them. I knew the truth now, that the people-shaped creatures did exist out in those woods. I tore out of there like the forest was burning down around me. I ran all the way to my car. I drove all the way home. I showed for hours and cried under the water. I don't know why the tears fell except for the fact that I was overwhelmed. The stories from my childhood had been validated, and in their new real form they were nasty. I called my mother again and she told me what I'll tell you now. Don't go looking for the secrets that the forest doesn't want to share. There is proof out there. I could go back out there and maybe even acquire it. Capture one of the beasts in a net or a cage. But it's been done, hasn't it? I grew up in Ibor City in Tampa, Florida, and have always been fascinated by the unexplained. My parents instilled a hard work ethic and taught me to always be observant in order to get ahead in life. As a self-proclaimed paranormal expert, I have always kept my eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. As the owner of a small computer store in town, I noticed a sudden decline in business. At first I thought it was just a rough patch or the state of the economy. However, as time went on, I became more and more convinced that something strange was going on. Customers were no longer coming in and my profits were dwindling. I knew I had to investigate the situation and find out what was really going on. It all started when I noticed the owner of a competing computer store across town seemed to always be one step ahead of me. No matter what promotion or sale I offered, he had a better one. It was as if he knew exactly what I was planning before I even did. I found this strange but didn't think much of it at the time. It may sound obsessive, but I began to investigate him and his store and watch his every move. The more I watched, the more convinced I became that there was something seriously fishy going on. His behavior was strange, and there were some things that just didn't add up. For one thing, he never left. Ever. It was as if he lived there full time. I never once saw him leave. He didn't go to lunch. He didn't go home after work. It seemed like a was in that shop working 24 by 7. As I continued my investigation, I noticed more and more strange things. He would often have secret meetings with shady looking people in the back of his store, and there were times when his eyes seemed to glow in a strange way. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I knew something was off. I didn't involve anyone else in my investigation as I didn't want to risk anyone thinking I was insane. However, I did confide in my spouse about my suspicions, and they were supportive but skeptical. I guess it was understandable, but through thick and thin, your spouse is supposed to have your back. As time went on, my fear and anxiety increased. The more I uncovered, the more convinced I became that the owner of the competing store was up to something nasty. I had to uncover the truth, no matter what it took. I began to do some research on the strange occurrences and behavior I had witnessed. I eventually came across some information that led me to believe that the owner of the competing store was a lizard man. According to my research, there are lizard men in elite circles such as the Illuminati, and it all started in the late 20th century. They seem to have gotten their powers from the ancient Sumerian deity Enki, who is often depicted as a serpent or reptilian figure. Lizard men and reptilian humanoids are often members of elite secret societies like the Illuminati and are said to secretly control world events. Lizard men are not only real but are also involved in a global conspiracy to subjugate humanity. There is tons of evidence online of the shape-shifting abilities of some world leaders and the prevalence of reptilian symbolism in popular culture. There are many who dismiss this as pseudo-scientific or paranoid delusions, but standing right in front of me was a lizard man with glowing eyes and he was stealing my livelihood. 
After uncovering all this information, I confronted the owner of the store and accused him of being involved in some sort of conspiracy. He told me I was crazy and called the cops on me. The cops questioned me, but I told them I was just looking to strike up a partnership with another computer store in the area and that he was just trying to make his competition look bad. Turns out what I said to get out of a bind was, in fact, completely true. He hired people to leave negative Yelp reviews for my store and tarnish my good name and who knows how much it has cost me. Some of my customers have told me that every time they go into his store, he is talking about how my business is a front for illegal activities and he tells people that I'm involved with a satanic cult. I couldn't believe that someone could be so ruthless and cruel. I finally decided to take action. My friend agreed to take his phone in there and record what the guy said. He casually asked the store owner if he knew anything about my business and the hateful lies that spewed out of his mouth were outrageous. After having him on tape slandering my good name and my business's name, I gave my evidence to my lawyer and we were able to reach a sizable settlement and the man has moved elsewhere and taken his shady ways out of my beloved community. I also reached out to other business owners in the area and warned them about him, his creepy secret society, his slanderous ways, and how vulnerable we are to these lizard men. It wasn't easy, but eventually, I was able to take him down and bring justice to Ybor City and have rebuilt my reputation slowly but surely. Looking back on this experience, I feel a mix of emotions. On the one hand, I am proud of myself for standing up to this lizard man and fighting for what I believe in. On the other hand, I am still haunted by the thought that there are people out there who are willing to do whatever it takes to get ahead, even if it means hurting others. This experience has taught me to be more vigilant and aware of the world around me. It has also shown me that even the most seemingly absurd theories can have some basis in reality. But most of all, it has given me a renewed sense of hope and confidence that I can overcome any obstacle if I remain true to my values and work hard. One word of wisdom, friends. Beware the lizard men. They are real, and as good as I feel these days, I constantly feel like I shook up a hornet's nest, and it's just a matter of time before he gets his fellow lizard people to strike me down. I've been an avid hunter my entire life. Some of my fondest memories are of going on hunting trips in Michigan with my dad as a kid. He taught me so much and we used to spend so much quality time together back in the day. I really miss him. Every time I go hunting now, the memories come pouring back and I can still feel his presence with me. A few months ago I went to his old hunting cabin deep in the woods on the one year anniversary of his death. It was my way of honoring him and think it was what he would have wanted. But I don't think he could ever prepare me for what I saw on that trip. I honestly figured I would be such an emotional mess that I wouldn't be able to get any real tracking done and thought that it would just be good to get out there and think about all the good times we had together. But to my own amazement, I was able to track a nice 10 point buck that would walk right across one of our old deer stands. I figured it would be a great way to honor the old man and I could make some nice venison backstrap like we used to do together. So I was out in the woods tracking the buck for a few hours and I heard something big rustling around in the bushes. I thought it was the deer, but when I got closer, I saw something really strange. It was this huge animal that walked on its hind legs. This thing was super tall, like seven feet tall, and it had these crazy glowing blue eyes. I'd never seen anything like it before. It was crazy. His face looked kind of like a wolf, but kind of looked demonic and sort of like a human, but not at the same time. It was a horrifying combination. It had hair all over its body and had big, bulging muscles. I guess I was in shock because I just stood there with my rifle and froze. I didn't know how to react, and I couldn't move. I was so freaked out. Then the beast looked right at me with its freaky blue eyes and sort of hunched over. We both froze and stared at each other for a good while. I couldn't tell which of us was more surprised, me or it. Then all of a sudden, the beast let out this wicked roar that sounded like multiple animals at once. 
It was awful and it freaked me out so badly that I just unloaded the whole magazine of rounds at him. I'm not sure if I hit him or not, but thankfully it was enough to scare the beast off and it took off into the woods. I got my bearings about me and ran back toward the cabin as quickly as I could. I slammed the cabin door shut and kept my rifle aimed at the door in case the beast wanted revenge. I spent pretty much the entire night like that, but luckily I didn't see the beast again that night. I was freaked out and didn't sleep a wink. The next morning I called up all my hunting buddies and described what I had seen, but they all told me I just had too many brewskis and didn't believe a word of it. I was freaked out and I cut my hunting trip short and figured I had done my daddy proud. I didn't catch a deer, but I stumbled across the scariest beast in all of America. That was one for the books. After I got home, I hopped on the World Wide Web and got to searching around on the internet to see if anyone else had seen something like what I had seen. Turns out I'm not the only one. I found a lot of information on something called the Michigan Dog Man. The physical description matches exactly what I saw. Seven feet tall, standing on its hind legs with huge muscles. Oddly enough, some of the people who have claimed to have seen the dog man claim it had orange eyes, and some claim it was blue like the one I had seen. I became pretty obsessed with it after that and read everything about the dog man that I could get my hands on. I went back to Dad's old cabin and checked all the trail cams to see if it had picked any pictures up. Sure enough, there was my ten-point buck taunting me but I didn't get a single picture of the dog man. I set up cameras all over the place and have spent pretty much every weekend I can up in the cabin trying to find the dog man again. I've returned to the place where I first spotted him but can't find any tracks or anything to lead me to him. The beast is elusive, but I'll spend the rest of my life tracking him down if I have to. I've always been a God-fearing man but never believed in Bigfoot, UFOs, aliens and all that kind of stuff. But seeing the dog man with my own two eyes has completely changed my mind about all of that. It made me realize how close-minded I've been my whole life. Just because it hasn't happened to me doesn't mean it hasn't happened to anyone else in the world. And the frustration I felt when trying to explain what I experienced to my best friends only to be shut down and ridiculed. That just ain't right. The truth is that we have no idea what's really out there. What's really going on. I've stopped watching the news because I now believe that the news that's being shoved down our throats is more like propaganda trying to get us to think and behave a certain way. The truth I've found from my own experience has been right in front of our eyes all along. We're just being programmed to not use our God-given sense and to just listen to whatever they want us to believe. We heard the howling for weeks. Before that, it was the shrieking of our chickens at 4 a.m. The animals always heard it coming long before we did. We learned to listen for those chickens. We listened for the cows in their stalls. We listened for our old bloodhound, who would anxious pace the halls with one eye glued to the front door. We always thought that was funny. Whatever it was outside, we never expected it to come through the front door. We never expected it to come to the house at all. That shows how little we knew, huh? The howling started in the summer, early June. It was so far away the first night that it, we mistook it for the wind. We thought a dry thunderstorm might be coming in from the west, the same direction as the forest at the edge of our farmland. When the wind and thunder ripples through those trees, the forest makes all sorts of unholy sounds. We thought the howls were the same sort, terrifying in nature but harmless in reality. That was another mistake. Each night the sounds got closer. On the first night, our hound had merely pointed her ears toward the window. The next night she faced the glass and growled. Then the pacing began. By that third night, it was as the thunder had descended on just our farm. The howls were deafening. They occurred so late in the night that we had no hopes of preparing for them. We tried to stay up, to spot whatever was out there for ourselves, but each time our old age caught up to us and lulled us to a bitter sleep. 4 a.m., almost like clockwork, we'd wake to a disturbance. 
We'd run to the door, sometimes armed and sometimes not, rushing into the porch to yell at our mysterious intruder. They were always gone. The bestial shrieking would always end the moment we opened the door. The cows would murmur and quiet down. The chickens would clean their feathers. What could we do, we wondered. How could we trap this thing? How could we get our eyes on it in order to understand just what we were dealing with? We didn't come up with any genius plan. We hired back one of our old farmhands, a sturdy boy with a military past that he rarely spoke about. We described what we were dealing with and he agreed to sit up on our porch waiting for the beast to come. We thought that would settle it. We knew he was a crack shot with a rifle. We knew he wouldn't scare easy. That night the howling was louder than ever before. It wasn't loud enough to hide that man's screaming. While the howl was low and as smooth as the breeze, our farmhand's cries were sharp, piercing, and erratic. He was attacked. We were sure of it. No man would scream like that unless they were being ripped apart. When we joined him on the porch, however, it was clear that the man was in one piece. As before, when we opened the door, the invader fled. Our guard stood trembling on the porch, skin as white as bone and eyes as wide as a flower in the sun. It didn't make sense to us then, but he was rambling about a man. We thought whatever he'd seen must have triggered some dormant memories from his time in the military. There was no way that the howling we'd heard was made by a human being. That was our last night with a guard on our porch. We recommitted ourselves in that moment to spot the creature on our own. As terrified as our farmhand was, we were relieved to know that thus far the monster had yet to attack any of our livestock. Initially, we wanted to protect our land. We wanted to repel the invader. Something about the farmhand's encounter steered us closer toward morbid curiosity. We didn't think we were in danger. We just wanted to know. We wanted to solve the mystery that had rolled across our farm like a cloud of fog. We sat on our porch with a pot of coffee and a checkers board between us. We made it to 2 a.m. We woke yet again to the ruckus. This time the fence around our chickens was groaning and spitting, bending and breaking under some immense pressure. We chased the sound. The howling was a whimper. When we finally cornered it, we saw the beast was snared by the fractured ends of our own fence. The farm itself had caught the invader, not us. Now its arm was pinned by two planks of snapped wood. We had spent weeks waiting for this moment, and now that it was upon us, we were as insignificant as the hens anxiously pattering on the other side of the fence. The beast was in front of us. Now what? We were baffled for one simple reason. The farmhand had been right. We were looking at a man. His back was engorged, swollen and curved to the point that his spine appeared to be shaped like a scythe. From head to toe he was covered in thin, wiry fur. He snarled when he looked at us. Spit ran from his lips to his chin. His teeth were pointed, more canine than primate. What were we looking at? We raised our rifle and took aim. We had to be rid of this beast after all. Then. Behind us, true thunder finally cracked in the cruelest dry storm of the season. It cracked like a whip and we jumped out of our skin, expecting there to be another monster behind us. We turned, misfired the weapon and stumbled. The beast tore itself free. It ran. We fired another shot but missed. It stayed away from our farm after that. Our hound still paces the hallways when the summer rolls in but we haven't heard the howl in years. What about you, I wonder? Have you heard anything like this before? So there I was, right. Working at this bird sanctuary in Central Oregon, we were trying to keep tabs on the population of great gray owls in the area. They were quite scarce in the area a couple of years back, and we were busting our chops to help them bounce back. Now let me tell you, these owls are a headache to track. They're nocturnal, elusive, 
and getting one tagged is like threading a needle while riding a roller coaster. Imagine a cat, but with wings and a beak. This mission had me out in some rather desolate wilderness spots, and often I was flying solo. This was one of those solo missions, dead of winter. I had a few baited traps set up in areas we'd spotted the owls on trail cams. Not easy birds to lure, mind you, so I wasn't betting on a jackpot, but I had to check on them, just in case we got lucky. The path to these traps was a treacherous one, only manageable with a snowmobile. There were three traps to get to. Two nestled deep in the forest and one across a frozen lake. Now, the budget we were working with wasn't exactly lavish, so I was stuck with this snowmobile from the 80s. But hey, it was lighter than the modern beasts, so I felt somewhat safer taking it over the lake. First, I inspected the traps in the forest. One was empty, and the other held a curious raccoon. I let the raccoon go and set my sights on the lake. I had to make my way out of the thick forest, across a frozen field, and then navigate down a hill to the lake. There was a creek nearby that usually froze over in winter, but I didn't have to cross it. As I reached the open field, I got this weird feeling. Can't quite put my finger on it even in hindsight, but something was off. I shrugged it off and pressed on. I did have this urge to turn back, but I had a job to do. Couldn't just leave a trap unchecked. I knew I was near the lake when I saw the blue ice gleaming in the sunlight. The only contrast in the otherwise white, snow-covered landscape. I parked the sled near the trap. I couldn't spot anything inside, but there was this foul smell in the air. We use mice as bait in the traps. They do have a certain smell and the owls are drawn to it, but this... This smell was different. It was putrid. I scanned the area for any dead animals, but there were no signs. Usually when I roll in on the snowmobile, anything with legs takes off. But if you look closely, you can usually see tracks scattered around. But this time, there was nothing. The only tracks I saw were the ones I'd left when setting the trap a couple of days prior. I was about to hop back on the snowmobile and get going. That's when I spotted something. A pair of eagle talons just barely visible through the snow. They were about 30 yards from my sled. We do have eagles in Central Oregon, but they're a rare sight. This looked like detached talons or a carcass. It hadn't flown away when I arrived, so I assumed it was a goner. Finding a pair of eagle talons is quite a find, and I thought I'd take them back to the sanctuary. But as I got closer, that rancid smell hit me like a freight train. It's not like a dead animal in winter to smell that bad. That should have been my cue to bolt. But curiosity got the best of me. I really wanted those talons, you know. As I started to approach what I figured was an eagle carcass, something shifted beneath the snow. I took a step back as soon as I saw it move, but it was tough to navigate quickly through the snow. The creature that rose from the snow did so slowly. It moved like it was ancient. Its bones were making these cracking sounds. It was horribly thin, barely more than skin and bones. I was amazed it was even alive given its condition. It had its back to me when it rose, so I hadn't seen its face yet. Its feathers were pure white. I thought it must have some kind of albinism. I quickly returned to my sled and started it up. The eagle was close enough that I wanted some distance between us, just in case it decided to attack. That's when it turned around. And I can't begin to tell you how petrified I was. The creature was feathered all over except for its face. Its face was just bone, stripped of skin. I couldn't see any eyes in the dark sockets, but when it turned to face me, I knew it saw me. Eyes or not. I didn't see a beak. I don't think it had one. There was a flap of red flesh hanging down from its throat. I guess that was its tongue. I was so terrified that I was fumbling with the ignition on the snowmobile. It took three attempts to get it started and all the while the creature kept its gaze locked on me. It began to shuffle towards me. Its movements were disjointed, like its legs weren't properly attached to its body. It's hard to explain. I managed to get the snowmobile running before it reached me and I took off. I kept looking back, but it didn't give chase. I know what I saw wasn't just a sick or injured eagle. The local tribes have a name for it, but I won't utter it here. 
The legends warn of their danger to humans, and I count myself lucky to have gotten away as easily as I did. I think I must have disturbed it from a deep slumber, which is perhaps why it didn't pursue me. I can't say for sure, but what I do know is I won't be going back to that area alone, or without a firearm. You know, I used to think those tales about cryptozoological creatures were all just tall tales, pure imagination. I mean, my little sister's obsessed with all those documentaries on television about Bigfoot, Nessie, Chupacabra, you name it. I'd be trying to hammer out an essay for English class, and I'd hear these wild accounts blaring from the living room. I gotta tell you, though, the joke's on me. I'm a believer now. I had a run-in of my own. And boy do I feel stupid for doubting all those stories. Now here I am, sharing my own encounter. And let me tell you, it's as real as it gets. This actually happened to me. So I just started working this new job at a 24-hour diner a couple of months ago. That's why I was up at all hours, since my shift sometimes ended late into the night. Technically, I'm not supposed to be out in the woods past dark, but my parents weren't too fussed and I figured no park ranger would really care. I was coming back from a late shift, we'd had a real rush around 2 a.m., truckers and all, and by the time I was heading home it was nearly dawn. I had just dropped off a co-worker whose place I'd never been to before. I was full of confidence, telling them it was no biggie when in reality I wasn't sure how to get back to the main road from their house. Well, just my luck. I didn't know the way and I got myself lost. I felt like a real dunce for getting lost. But hey, that's life, right? Took a wrong turn somewhere and ended up on this really old trail that led deeper into the woods. I was looking for a clear spot to turn around in, but all I saw was a narrow, winding path with dense undergrowth on either side. Just a bunch of old trees and the occasional deer crossing the path. Not much else. So there I was, driving and feeling more and more uneasy. And that's when things went from zero to a hundred real quick. I saw this figure on the road ahead and thought it was just another deer. Sure, I thought it was a bit strange that the eyes were glowing a bright green, but I didn't really think much of it. I've seen some deer with reflective eyes at night, so I figured it was just one of those guys. As I got closer, things were definitely getting weirder. I could now see that it wasn't just a deer. This thing was standing upright on two legs its eyes still glowing that eerie green. The figure didn't move away as I approached, which was even more odd. So now I'm thinking it's probably just some prankster in a costume trying to scare late night drivers. But the figure remained still as a statue as I got closer, which gave me the creeps. As I neared, I started to really freak out because I could see it wasn't a human at all. Like, it was way too tall and its body looked all wrong. I was pretty sure I was about to crash into this thing. I wanted to veer to the side, but I was too shocked to move. Just when I thought I was going to hit this creature, I made the decision to swerve off the trail. But right before I swerved, the thing just disappeared. Like one moment it was there, and then it was gone. My car has a sunroof, so I could see it wasn't on the road anymore, or in the trees above. So obviously, what I almost hit was not a human or a deer, because it disappeared into thin air and left no trace behind. It must have been incredibly fast because one moment it was right there in front of me and the next, it was just gone. Because I was so close I could tell that it was really tall. And that's why its eyes were so high off the ground. I couldn't really make out the shape of it because it was dark and basically a shadow. It was just tall and dark and those glowing green eyes. That's all I could really see. I sat in my car with it in park for what felt like forever. My heart was thudding in my chest and I was trying to steady my breathing. I made a U-turn right there on the trail. It was more of a three-point turn, really, and drove back the way I came. Somehow, I eventually found my way home from there. The entire drive back, I was just scanning the trees for those glowing eyes, but I didn't see anything. Once I got home, I immediately tried to look up what I saw on the internet. Some people think that these creatures are just misidentified animals or optical illusions, and that's what people see. I'm not so sure about that. 
This creature or whatever it was moved like no animal I've ever seen. I'm not an expert, but I don't know how any animal could have disappeared like that thing did. So, that's my story. Like I said, I thought all these tales were just made up, and then I experienced it for myself. At the very least, it was all really strange and I have no clue what I saw. I'm just telling myself that it was some kind of rare animal because if it wasn't, that really makes me question a lot of what I thought I knew about the world. So, it was a while back on a Friday night when I got a call about some rowdy teenagers causing a commotion. Now, in these parts, we'd often deal with kids disturbing the peace, especially on weekends. You know how it goes, small town blues, not much to do so they go out looking for trouble. Usually just the sight of my squad car was enough to make them straighten up, but this time, it was different. The complaint came from a neighbor living near a stretch of densely wooded hiking trails at the edge of town. These trails were about 14 miles long, and they weren't exactly well maintained, but people still liked to venture into the woods. Now there was a creek flowing through those woods, used to be a proper river back in the day, but it had dried up quite a bit. Funny how nature works, I can't explain it. Anyway, there was this old mill from the late 1800s near the creek. It had turned into a hangout spot for local teenagers, a place to drink and party. Last time I checked, that mill was a mess, full of empty cans, bottles, and graffiti. These kids thought they were far enough into the forest to avoid getting caught, but here's the thing. There were homes surrounding those woods, and people living there could hear all the racket. So, as the sheriff, it was my duty to check it out. I hopped in my squad car and headed towards the woods. When I arrived, I noticed there weren't any cars in the public parking lot nearby, but that didn't mean those clever teenagers hadn't parked elsewhere and walked in. Armed with my trusty flashlight, I made my way into the woods. Almost immediately, I could hear the laughter and shouting of the kids. They didn't sound too far off, certainly not far enough to be at the mill. At first, I thought they were on my left. But as I tried to follow the sounds, they shifted to my right. I called out, telling them to cut it out, but no one answered. Now I knew those kids had spotted me, and they were probably scramming as fast as they could. Despite that, I decided to continue towards the mill, cause that's where the neighbor claimed the lights and screams were coming from. Who knows, maybe there was still something going on there. As I walked deeper into the forest, it grew eerily quiet. The trail was overgrown, but I managed to find my way, guided by the beam of my flashlight. That's when I heard the voices again, just like before. They were screaming and laughing, but I couldn't make out any words. I pointed my flashlight towards the mill, but it was empty. Those kids were somewhere out there in the woods, but I couldn't pinpoint their exact location. The voices seemed to be coming from all directions yet they sounded both distant and close at the same time. It sent shivers down my spine and made me question what I was dealing with. Curiosity got the better of me, and I shined my light into the woods. That's when I saw it, multiple lights reflecting back at me. At first I thought they were just flashlights, but upon closer inspection, I realized they were eyes. There must have been at least a dozen pairs of eyes all at my eye level. They stayed hidden in the shadows, so I couldn't get a clear glimpse of their faces. But what I could see was their ghostly white skin. Those voices, they sounded human. But seeing those eyes, I knew there was something off about them. They weren't your ordinary teenagers, that's for sure. Slowly, I started backing away down the trail. I didn't want to run and risk provoking those things to chase after me. It was a chilling experience, to say the least. As I retreated, I couldn't resist shining my flashlight once more at the mill. I don't know why I did it. Maybe I wasn't thinking straight at that point. But what I saw made my blood run cold. The whole dilapidated building lit up with eyes. I didn't stick around to count them, but there were at least ten more pairs of those eerie eyes in there. The voices continued to follow me, echoing through the trees as I made my way back to my car. It was the most terrifying thing I had ever encountered. 
They seemed to come from all directions, some close by, others far away. It was as if they were trying to lure me off the trail or get me hopelessly lost. Now I'm not a religious person, but in that moment, I found myself praying to every deity I could think of, just to make it safely back to my car. Miraculously, I managed to find my way out, following the trail back. I was shaken to the core by the time I reached my car. I rushed back to the station and locked myself inside for the rest of my shift. I didn't know what to put in the report, as I never had a chance to speak to the person who made the complaint. It was just a message left on the answering machine at the station. I tried calling the number back, but it was disconnected. I decided to classify it as a dangerous black bear sighting in the woods, and we even put up barricades to keep people away from that area. I had no clue what those things truly were, but I knew one thing for certain. They weren't anything good. It was my responsibility to protect the folks in the community, so keeping them away from those creatures became my top priority. I was chilling with my buddies at Goshen Pond up in good old New Jersey near the Pinelands. We decided to go camping for some fun and adventure. And let me tell you, we were having a blast. Hiking, kayaking, swimming, you name it. Now it was around 7 or 8 in the evening and we were all gathered around the campfire cooking up some delicious grub and having a great time. The sun had just set, so it was getting pretty dark but we could still see what was going on. We were joking, laughing, and fooling around when suddenly this horrendous smell hit us like a ton of bricks. I'm telling you, it was like someone had cracked open a bunch of rotten eggs right under our noses. The stench was so strong, we thought the meat we brought had gone bad. But when we checked, it was all fine. That's when it hit us that something was off. And then things got real quiet. You know that eerie silence in movies just before something bad goes down? Yeah, that's what it was like. It gave me the creeps, my friends too. And then, in the distance, we heard this weird high-pitched scream. But let me tell you, it was no human scream. It was like nails on a chalkboard making my blood run cold. Even now, just thinking about it gives me the heebie-jeebies. We all just froze, staring at each other around the campfire. One of my buddies suggested it could be some wild animal like a coyote or a cat in distress. But deep down, we all knew it wasn't no ordinary critter. We scanned the tree line keeping an eye out for any signs of danger. We packed up our food real quick just in case it was some wild animal on the prowl. Just as we were putting out the fire we heard this strange beat, like soft drums pounding in the distance. It's hard to describe, but the sound kept getting louder and louder. We looked around, trying to figure out where the noise was coming from. We thought maybe it was some other campers nearby, but boy, were we wrong. Cause right at that moment, we saw it. I'm telling you, this thing was massive, at least six feet tall. And here's the kicker. My friends saw it too. I ain't making this up, I swear. It looked like something out of a nightmare. Huge wings like a freaking giant bat. And those eyes, man, they were glowing red like hot coals. I could make out its scaly skin and those wicked hawked legs like a dang lizard. But the face. Oh boy, the face was the freakiest part. It had a head like a goat with a long snout and horns sticking out of its forehead. But get this, it had bad ears too. And its tongue, man, it was so long. When it screeched, I could see those razor-sharp canine teeth and those red, glowing eyes. They just pierced right through it. This thing, this demon or whatever it was, just hovered there in the air. I couldn't tell you exactly how long it stayed, but it felt like an eternity, even though it was probably just a few seconds. We were petrified, unable to move or look away, just locked in a gaze with those menacing red eyes. And then, with another bone-chilling screech, it took off into the night, disappearing into the darkness. Let me tell you, we didn't waste a second. We sprinted to our tents, desperately grabbing our phones to capture any evidence of what we had just witnessed. But by the time we were ready, 
that creature was long gone. It had vanished in the blink of an eye. We huddled together in one tent, seeking solace in each other's presence, but sleep was out of the question. The events of that night had shaken us to our core. The next morning, we couldn't avoid talking about it. And guess what? We had all seen the exact same thing. I know it sounds insane, like a flying goat bat demon straight out of a horror movie, but I swear on everything that is holy, it was real. We even thought about reporting it to the authorities, but how do you explain something like that? Hey officer, we were out camping and this creature with wings and glowing red eyes paid us a visit. Yeah, like they'd believe us. We tried searching online for any similar sightings, but came up empty-handed. It was like we were the only ones who had encountered this monstrosity. And you know what's even worse? When we did talk about it with other people, they treated us like we were bonkers. They either thought we were crazy or accused us of making up stories. Since that night, things have changed for us. We're constantly on edge, more cautious than ever before. I avoid staying out after dark, and we all steer clear of wooded areas. No more camping, fishing, or hiking, especially if it's in the evening. We've become wary of the unknown, forever marked by that creature's evil presence. I'm grateful for the chance to share my story here. Maybe, just maybe, someone out there has experienced something similar. We can't be the only ones. It's high time we find some answers and unravel the mystery behind that nightmarish encounter. Because deep down, I know what we saw was real. They never see the monster coming, do they? I always thought that was the weird part of these stories. It's always out of the blue, an unexpected sighting. Not for me, not exactly. I didn't see it coming per se, but I knew it was there. I was looking for it and I had a trail to follow. There are reports in the southern United States of a large, ape-like creature. The details vary as much as the legitimacy of each claim. When enough of those stories line up, however, that's when I investigate. There's a team of us, but normally these preliminary investigations are done solo. It's quicker and cheaper to send one team member on a plane than it is to pack up the entire institution. If one thing is true about our government, they're penny pinchers. If the initial search discovers some additional proof, or if the fallout from the reported sighting escalates too high, then more people are dispatched to the location. Those people came after my encounter. They came, they searched, and they found something just like I did. I can't speak to their journey, though. Just know at the end of all this, I'm confident that the thing I saw was taken away in a cage. I was following up on reports of the ape beast in a stretch of Texas woods. A hiker had been scared half to death, and an off-duty fireman had seen something indescribable through the scope of his hunting rifle. The two reports wouldn't have seemed related at all, except for one specific detail. They described a stench. They described an acidic, earthy smell that made their throats sweat and their lungs curdle. I picked up that same aroma as I ventured into the woods. I found a few hair samples, long strands plucked by the trees and brush. The scent was coming from these strands. Eventually, one of the clusters of hair was near enough to a large animal trail that I thought, just maybe it would be the path of the beast. I got lucky. The longer I followed it, the stronger the smell became. That's how I knew I was close. I wrapped a handkerchief around my face to smother out the scent. It was burning my eyes and turning my stomach. I knew I had to continue even if it was getting hard to breathe. It embarrasses me to admit it, but eventually I gagged. I choked and vomited onto the ground, adding the odor of my own bile to the stink in the woods. I braced myself against a tree and wiped my mouth with my sleeve. When I reached for my water bottle, hoping to rinse the taste from my mouth, that's when it appeared. It didn't surprise me. It didn't catch me off guard. If I was emptying the contents of my stomach, I was confident that I was practically on top of the thing. The sound of my retching must have drawn it out. When the plastic brim of the bottle reached my lips, I saw it standing nearby. It loomed between the trees, 
ducking its head to avoid getting its hair tangled in the branches hanging from above. It cleared seven foot easy. I wish I could say it watched me and then vanished. But the ape beast was unhappy with how close I'd come. Its face was twisted in a snarl, narrowing its beady eyes and curling its lip to reveal massive canine teeth. Its flat nose flexed with every heaving breath. At the time, I couldn't imagine what had upset it. I must have been in its territory was all I could think. It wanted me out, plain and simple. And with my own sighting as fuel, I knew I could leave and come back with an entire team of capable hunters and trackers. I turned and ran. I heard its footfall strike the ground like a sledgehammer smacking concrete. It roared loudly and closed in. I wasn't going to let it catch, but I'd be lying if I said that I didn't feel its breath on my neck. The air from its mouth was so hot that it practically burned my skin. A rash broke out on my shoulders a few days later. I can't imagine what kind of bacteria was living on that thing. I stuck to the paths I knew would be too narrow for its massive body. After its shoulders struck more than a few trees, it slowed down. I lost it. And slowly but surely, the scent faded. I caught my breath and collapsed in my car, stripping away my outer layers and tossing them out the window. I was covered in the stink and it wasn't letting me breathe. I wondered if that was its purpose. If you can't breathe, you can't run. That's one way to gain advantage over your prey. Within the next two days, the full team was dispatched. Local news outlets were informed that a sick bear was caught in the woods and would be taken in for treatment. Sick bears are the usual explanation. Something that struck me as odd, however, is where the bear was supposedly caught. I was assured privately that it was the beast I saw, and I knew I couldn't be told the absolute truth due to the nature of our job, but the animal was caught miles away from my encounter. If it had been so eager to protect its territory when it spotted me nearby, why was it suddenly so keen to leave? Why had it traveled so far in such a short amount of time? You see, I want to end this story on a positive note. The institution I work for does a great job at keeping these wild areas safe. But sometimes we do overlook the details. For me, this territory is one of those details. If it was protecting its kin, for instance, and wanted to lead us away from its family, well, we wouldn't know that until the next sighting comes around, would we? Okay, so, here's the thing. I'm just an average guy. Nothing special about me, really. Live in a suburb just outside of Atlanta. Not a city dweller, but far from a country bumpkin, too. I guess you could say I'm comfortably in the middle. Now, I'm not going to name the place. I mean, you'll have to forgive me for that. But the fewer folks who can trace this back to me, the better, right? I hope you get where I'm coming from. Alright, so... You know how these stories usually start off with some sort of landmark, right? In this case, let's say the landmark is the old water tower. For a long time, it was the heart of the town pumping life into our homes, until it was abandoned. Now it just stands there, all rusty and silent like a ghost of our past. But, the thing is, that's not what this story is about. I mean, sure, the water tower is important, but the real focus... The real focus is on what happened there about 15 years ago. See, there was this time when people around town started talking about something weird happening at the water tower. Strange lights, odd noises, the kind of thing you'd expect in one of those late night paranormal television shows. And then, out of nowhere, the water tower. It just collapsed, just like that. No warning, no signs, just fell to the ground one night. And the strange thing is, no one could figure out why. Well. Maybe that's not entirely true. Some folks, the ones who saw the lights and heard the noises, they said it was because of some creature. Now, I know what you're thinking. A creature? Really? But the thing is, I saw it too. And it wasn't any animal I'd ever seen before. It was like a large shadow shifting and changing. Sort of like those Rorschach inkblots you see in movies. And the eyes, those glowing red eyes, they'd pierce right through you. 
After the tower fell, the creature just vanished, like it had never been there at all. But I remember it. I remember what I saw. Now here's where things get a bit weird. I've been working at the local library for a while now. I know, not the most exciting job, but it pays the bills. And every once in a while I get to go through old newspaper clippings. So a couple of months back I was going through some stuff about the water tower. And there it was. A report about our shadow creature. It was chilling. It read, I thought there was a wild dog in my backyard, but when I went out to see, it wasn't a dog. It was this huge shadow, constantly changing its form. And those red eyes, they stared right at me. That's not all, though. When I tried to find the person who had written the report, I found out they had died, a few days after the water tower collapsed. And that's not the only one. Every single person who had reported seeing the creature, they were all gone. Accidents, illnesses, you name it. It was like they had been cursed. So, here I am, wondering about this creature. Wondering if it had something to do with the water tower. Wondering if I'm next. I mean, I want to know more. I want to find out the truth. But what if that means I'll end up like the others? What do you think? I mean, should I dig deeper? Should I let someone else know about this? Or should I just keep my head down and forget all about it? There's a reason why people stop talking about the creature, right? There's a reason why it was forgotten. And maybe, just maybe, I don't want to know that reason. So here's a thing that happened to me when I was just a kid. We were living in this tiny place in Nevada, not too far from Nellis Air Force Base. Our house was on the west side of town, and there was this big desert area right behind our backyard. Kind of cool place for a kid, you know? My friends and I, we used to spend hours out there chasing lizards and pretending to be explorers. Anyway, one evening my dad had just come home from work and I heard him call out to me from the yard. His voice had this weird tone. I was the eldest and my younger siblings were already in bed so I was wondering what's up. I could feel that he was uneasy about something, something more than just needing help with his toolbox. My first thought was that he'd spotted a rattlesnake or something because we'd been seeing them around lately. So I rushed outside and he pointed at something that was hovering over the desert area, kind of southwest of our house. He was like, can you make out what that thing is? You see, I was pretty familiar with all sorts of aircraft. My grandpa had been taking me to every air show possible since I was just a kid. And my uncle, he worked as an engineer at Boeing. But this thing my dad was pointing at, it was making a sound like a far-off lawnmower. Not at all the kind of sound you'd expect from a helicopter hovering at that distance. I had seen my fair share of helicopters and this wasn't one of them. And we lived around planes, both civilian and military. This thing was not moving and it looked to be about the size of a school bus. It was hard to make out its exact shape, but I could swear it was circular and it had this weird glow. The light was a soft blue and it was flickering, almost like it was breathing. It reminded me of the way a flashlight's beam dances on the wall of a dark room. It just hung there in the air, as if it was spotlighting something beneath it. After we watched it for a few minutes, it began to drift slowly. The noise got a bit louder, but not as much as you'd expect from something that big that was hovering and moving slowly. The thing followed the course of the desert, west. It passed close to our house and then we lost sight of it as it drifted behind a sand dune. We walked around the south side of the house to try and catch sight of it again as it crossed the last few houses in our street. We saw it follow the desert path about 50, 60 feet above the ground. It still wasn't making a lot of noise. But then, just like that, in the blink of an eye, the light went from in front of us to hovering over the neon lights of Las Vegas, way off in the distance. A quick Google search will tell you that's over 30 miles. The crazy thing is, at that point, there was no noise at all. It was just silent, yet it had accelerated instantly. 
It covered those 30-something miles in the fraction of a second. We watched it the whole time, not believing what we were seeing. It then hovered over the city for about half a second, then it shot straight up at the same speed it had crossed the desert. And then we lost sight of it in the night sky as it ascended straight up. The stars are always bright at night in that part of Nevada. I remember as it went up, it lost that glow and changed to a bright blue that got brighter and brighter. It kind of looked like a firework that didn't explode, but it went much higher and faster. The next morning on the school bus, I told the kids from the end of our street about what my dad and I had seen. They all laughed at me, and I was the joke for the next couple of days. I was kind of a weird kid, you know, more into books and stargazing than sports. The subject didn't come up again until maybe a year later when I got a bit more popular and ended up being friends with one of those kids. Turned out he and his family had seen the same thing, but he had been too embarrassed to admit it in front of the others on the bus, especially after the way they had all reacted. His parents had even told him not to talk about it because people would think they were crazy. This was all back in the late 90s. I went on to study aerospace engineering and have had the chance to work on some classified projects involving aircraft and other military tech. Even spent some time as an analyst in the U.S. Air Force, focusing on studying equipment imagery, understanding their functions and capabilities, and providing that information for operational needs. And let me tell you, nothing moves like that thing moved. Nothing we have, nothing anyone has. I know some will choose to believe me and others won't. I'm certain about what I saw, but I don't think I'll ever get a satisfactory explanation for my encounter. You know, I've been tuning into your show for some time now and I've finally plucked up the courage to share this tale of mine. It's about something strange that happened in our house and I'm really curious to hear what you and your listeners make of it. So, my partner Alice and I, we live in this pretty old house in a residential neighborhood of Missouri. It's one of those houses that has seen a fair share of decades and has some pretty interesting architectural details, you know? It's got these tall ceilings and these big old-fashioned windows and it just oozes character. Anyway, we live on the ground floor. That's going to matter later. So about six months after we moved in, we were getting the place ready for Christmas. You should know Alice and I, we're big on holidays. We love the whole shebang, decorating the tree, hanging stockings, the works. One evening we were watching some Christmas movies on the television. You know, those Hallmark ones that are just the right kind of cheesy. It was getting late, around 9 p.m., so we decided to switch off the porch light and head to bed. Now, our house. It's got this quaint little foyer right as you enter. There's a staircase on the right that leads up to our neighbor's place, and our front door is just across from the main entrance. And then there's this door next to the staircase that leads to the cellar. When we first moved in, Alice and I had taken a look at the cellar. It was pretty spacious and old with all these corners and crevices. The cellar door, it's got this old latch on it. One of those that you have to slide and fit into a groove. We always keep it locked unless the landlord tells us that someone's coming for maintenance. So on this particular Christmas Eve, Alice and I... We're heading to bed when we hear the main door into the foyer creak open. It was odd because our neighbors were away for the holidays and the door was locked. Alice went over and peeked through the peephole but the hallway was empty. We shrugged it off as maybe just the wind or something and went back to bed. But then, just as we were about to turn in, we noticed that the cellar door was ajar. Just a little, maybe an inch or so. But it was strange. It was locked when Alice checked the foyer earlier. We decided to check it out just to be on the safe side. The cellar was empty and cold, just as it should be. We locked the door again and went back to bed. The next morning when we were heading out for a walk, we noticed the cellar door was open again. Alice was sure she had locked it. She even texted our neighbor asking if they had come down for some reason. But they were still away, remember? They made some joke about us having a Christmas ghost. We tried to laugh it off and went about our day. But that night, the cellar door was wide open again. 
and I mean so wide open that it was blocking our front door. Both of us a little freaked out, we decided to check the cellar again, but it was empty. We've checked multiple times since then and haven't found anything or anyone, but every single night, no matter how tightly we lock it or what we put in front of it, the cellar door just keeps opening. Maybe our neighbors were onto something with their ghost joke, because there's no way for the latch to just pop open on its own. We're hoping that once our landlord puts a proper lock on the door, this all stops. But if it doesn't, well, I guess I'll be writing to you again with an update. I mean, if it is a ghost, I hope it's a friendly one. Given the holiday season and all, a ghost of Christmas past, maybe? Anyway, fingers crossed, right? Hey there. It's good to finally share this story with you all, and I'm grateful you guys are open to hearing things like this. You see, back when the whole world was dealing with the pandemic in 2020, my buddy Jake and I both found ourselves without jobs. Our restaurant was forced to close due to lockdowns and we were stuck at home, just like everyone else. We figured we might as well make the most of the situation, given we didn't really have much else to do. We didn't have any big responsibilities tying us down, so we thought, why not take advantage of the free time? After bouncing ideas around, we decided to take a road trip across the country. We had always wanted to visit every state in the U.S., but never had the time. And now, we had nothing but time. We didn't really have a set route or plan. We just knew we wanted to hit all 50 states. We got some tips from other friends who had taken road trips before and got everything ready. We're from Texas, so we decided to start from there and head west. We had enough provisions for a couple of weeks. Lots of canned goods, some camping gear, and a bunch of snacks. We weren't really trying to rush it. We wanted to take our time, enjoy the journey. We had been cooped up in a kitchen for far too long. The first night we grilled some burgers over a fire. Not the same as a rabbit but it was what we had and we loved the idea of cooking our own food outside. We set up our tent in a quiet, secluded spot, and there was a light drizzle that night. But we were dry inside our tent. The next morning we packed up and got on the road. We covered about 150 miles that day, which was a lot for us. We found a nice spot by a lake to set up camp for the night. We knew there was supposed to be good fishing in that lake. We didn't catch any fish, but we had a good time trying. We turned in early around 9 p.m., but around midnight we started hearing something moving around outside the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two feet. Now Jake and I have done a lot of camping, so we can usually tell when it's an animal moving around. But this, this was different. And then we caught a whiff of something. It was like nothing I'd ever smelled before. Jake wanted to go out and investigate, but I convinced him it was best to stay put and wait. I was hoping whatever it was would just leave, but the noise continued. Eventually, we decided to take a peek outside. What we saw shocked us. There was a huge, hairy creature poking around our campsite. It was only about 20 feet away. It was standing on two feet, but it was definitely not human. I estimated it to be around seven feet tall. Jake and I just looked at each other, eyes wide with fear. We thought we were done for if that thing decided to come closer. I couldn't figure out what it was. It looked like some sort of giant gorilla or something. It seemed to be sniffing around. Then it turned its head towards us. Its eyes were small and dark. The face looked like something prehistoric. Then it made this incredibly loud howling sound. All I could think to do was to fire off a warning shot with our flare gun. As soon as the flare lit up the sky, this creature, whatever it was, took off into the woods, making some kind of guttural noises. I tell you, I've never heard anything like it before. Even thinking about it now gives me the shivers. We didn't sleep a wink that night. As soon as daybreak came, we went out to take a look around. We found a path of crushed vegetation leading away from our campsite, and there were these enormous footprints that looked human, but they were way bigger than either of our feet. Jake and I didn't need to discuss it. We both knew it was time to get back to civilization. 
That encounter had scared the living daylights out of us. We drove until we found a small town. It must have looked like a couple of homeless guys walking into the local diner. After we had eaten and calmed down a bit, we started talking about what we had seen. I was expecting the locals to laugh at us, but they didn't seem all that surprised. Turns out there were quite a few stories about Bigfoot sightings in that area. I was taken aback at how nonchalantly they discussed it. We thought about making an official report, but that's when the teasing started. So we decided against it. In the end, we didn't report it. This is actually the first time I've really spoken about it since that day. Sometimes I wonder if we should have just kept going on our road trip. I gotta tell you, that night is still fresh as the morning dew in my mind. I was new, green as grass, just started as a ranger in the Allegheny National Forest. Jerry, my partner, was an old hand, been doing this for years, the kind of guy who's so at home in the woods that he makes Daniel Boone look like a city slicker. Anyway, we were out doing some trail maintenance, the usual stuff, fixing signs, clearing brush, that kind of thing. It was then I saw it. This thing. It was like a dog, but not just any dog. Picture a hound on steroids with something wild, fierce, and straight-up feral about it. It had these eyes, I swear they were almost human, glowing like burning coals. And it was huge. Werewolf sounds crazy, but that's the only thing I could compare it to. The sight of it raised the hair on the back of my neck. Jerry saw it too. I remember his face going white as a sheet. That ain't right, he muttered, clutching the handle of his spade a little tighter. But the creature was gone as quick as it appeared, melting into the underbrush like a shadow. By the time night fell, we had almost convinced ourselves it was a trick of the light or some exotic critter escaped from a zoo. We were in this little cabin, way out on the trails, the kind of place that gets so dark at night you can't see your hand in front of your face. Now you've got to understand something about the forest at night. It's not quiet like you might think. It's alive with sounds. Wind in the trees, the rustling of leaves, distant hoots and caws. But this was different. This was a growl. It was low and throaty, almost like the rumble of an earthquake. It started quiet, then grew louder, closer. Jerry and I exchanged glances. That growl, it wasn't like anything we'd ever heard. It seemed to vibrate in our chests, get under our skin. Every instinct I had was screaming at me to bolt, but we were in the middle of the forest, miles from anywhere. Then there were scratches, long, deliberate, at the cabin door. The sound sent shivers down my spine. I remember grabbing a flashlight and a hunting knife. That was all we had. Jerry was clutching an old axe, his knuckles white. We were both wide-eyed and silent, listening, waiting. We weren't top of the food chain anymore. I don't know how long it prowled outside, taunting us with its presence. An hour, maybe two? Felt like a dang eternity. Finally, the scratching stopped, and that terrifying growl faded into the distance. We didn't sleep a wink that night. Come morning, we found the outside of the door covered with claw marks, each one as long as my hand. That's when we knew. It wasn't our imagination. It wasn't a joke. There was something out there, something we couldn't explain. To this day, every howl in the distance, every rustle in the bushes, I think about that night. But I'm still here, doing my job, just with one eye always watching always waiting for that thing to return. They buried it. Not physically, you know. But they did everything in their power to make sure that the thing I saw was forgotten. I haven't forgotten. I guess they're just counting on the fact that no one is going to believe my story. So far, they've been right. Nothing haunts me more than that. Not the encounter itself, not the aftermath. What haunts me is knowing that no matter what, my truth will always be considered a lie. 
That encounter is such a big part of me now. You might as well call my entire life these days a fabrication. The nightmares, the cold sweats, the distrust. Is all of it a lie? And for what? Do you think I thrive on the looks I get when the details start to slip out? You think I enjoy being called crazy? You think I liked watching my family and friends turn their backs on me? I didn't. But I know who did. The same government bodies who came out to help me. The same ones who said they were there to save my life, to record my story and ensure that I'd be heard. I can't tell you exactly who they were. I'm sure you can piece it together. I string the wrong sequence of keywords together though, and they'll be knocking at my door at two in the morning. I'd rather not deal with them again. The phone calls and the cars following me home from the grocery store are enough interference for me. I don't need any more. When I was still with the park service, I thought it made me part of something. I thought it meant I was on the same team as the rest of the government, contributing to making this country something beautiful. I thought it meant I'd have allies. I was an idiot then. One afternoon on a swelting but insignificant day, I came across an abandoned campsite. Everyone had checked out of the park as far as I knew and there were no reports of squatters in the area. I checked our records and sure enough someone had been there. They'd left that morning though, left in a hurry I guess. I sorted my way through the damage to find out why. I had to tally up the details after all, figure out how big of a fine they'd be looking at for leaving so much of their property and debris behind in our park. But as I was lifting the lip of a tossed backpack, something growled nearby. It wasn't a bear or a big cat. It wasn't a wild dog or a wolf. I knew what those calls sounded like. This was different. It was deeper. It felt heavy, seeping in through my ears and weighing down my brain with dread. It pushed my usual bravery down into the dirt. I swallowed the nerves building in my throat and turned to search the tree line. I had to face it, right? Much to my surprise, the growl hadn't come from an animal. It had come from a man. There was a man in those trees, standing close to seven feet tall. That was enough to dwarf me. I was already prepared to run. His wardrobe is what gave me pause. He was dressed in something like a ghillie suit. Those things snipers wear, you know? They lay down in the earth and completely disappear. This one looked like hair. Wiry ropes of reddish-orange fibers draped every inch of his body, concealed his face almost completely. I could barely make out the flat nose and cracked lips that made up his lower face. The skin there was deeply wrinkled. It had to be a costume, right? I only doubted that when it roared. It bellowed at me and started to move forward. Something deep in my bones. Call it instincts or fight or flight, whatever. Some deep part of me knew I had to leave. I had to run. Clear out of there and save my own skin before I got wrapped up in whatever had come wandering out of the woods. And I got out of there safely. Not a scratch on me. Does that make the story worse somehow? I called my superiors and reported what I saw, continuing to insist that it was just a man. I tried to get in contact with the camper who had left that site in the morning. I still haven't heard from them. It was a different agency who got back to me, the same ones I mentioned at the start. They wrote down all the details, assured me that what I had to say was important, and then they disappeared. My job disappeared with them. Word got around that I was delusional, unsafe, and insubordinate. I don't know where those stories came from, but I do know that they stuck. I was blacklisted in some way. I couldn't return to any stretch of government work. I couldn't contact my former peers, who avoided me like I had the plague. And the more I pushed, the more the agents came back around. The cars in my rearview mirror. The heavy breathing on the other end of the phone. It's like they want to keep me paranoid. They want to keep me rattled. They want my life to be just as unbelievable as it was that day in the woods. The longer they keep me on edge, the more I talk about the phone tap and the black vehicles, the less reliable I become. Suddenly I've imagined it all. There's no one following me. There's no one calling. And that means there couldn't have been someone in the park that day, right? That means whatever I saw probably didn't exist. 
When those realizations sink in, the result is always the same. Whoever's listening starts to laugh. I don't blame them, though. That's the deep part of them, isn't it? It's easier to disregard the story than it is to believe it. After all, what if I was wrong? What if that hadn't been a man at all? What if it was something else? I was working as a forest ranger up here in Anchorage when this happened. My job at the time was to patrol the remote areas of the park, making sure nobody ever lit fires they weren't supposed to or threw litter where they weren't supposed to. I was equipped with my own radio and had a rifle with me at all times in case I had to deal with any squatters or crazy people who came into the woods looking to do bad things. It was just before midnight on a Friday evening. I had been patrolling an area called Barney Creek. I hadn't noticed anything unusual happening, so I wasn't expecting anything bad to happen that night. But all that completely changed when I found a deceased person. A skeleton. More on that in just a second. On my way back to my car is when I saw this body lying across the trail that I'd been walking on. At first I thought it was maybe an animal, due to the condition that the body was in. But as I got closer and looked again, I realized it wasn't a bear corpse or any other animal from the woods. This was obvious because there was no fur covering its flesh. It had obviously died quite a while ago, too. After shining my flashlight around the area more thoroughly with a sense of growing apprehension tapping into whatever bravery might be needed, I slowly approached the remains. I took out my camera before beginning to take pictures of the evidence. I was not prepared for what I saw when I moved closer in to take a look at the skull. It was pretty badly rotted, and there appeared to be a bullet hole right behind the left eye socket. Some brutal execution must have happened, maybe even torture, judging by how bony and ripped out their chest area looked. Whoever they were, somebody wanted them dead, and the killer would not accept any opposition from this person they were going after. This meant that whoever killed them was still around, and they'd be coming back. They could have been waiting out for me in the forest, possibly planning to take out their sick revenge on me. I had one mission, to get out of there as soon as possible and alert the authorities for backup. I had to run back as fast as I could, which was hard with how freaked out and terrified I was. Still getting lost and having a hard time recognizing the trails. My head was a mess and every time a branch or leaf would brush against me, I just suspected it was something that would kill me. Kind of like a monster's claw reaching up from behind bushes, ready to grab me by the neck and snap it like a twig. My heart raced with so much fear that I swear it felt as if it were almost going to pop out of my chest. Without any warning at all, and after what seemed like forever, I got far away but just collapsed onto the forest floor completely exhausted. I was there until morning. As soon as morning arrived, I was successful in returning to the area, but the remains were gone. I couldn't tell if somebody had come in and taken them or maybe some animal decided to bury the body under some dirt or leaves. In any case, it didn't matter much because no one was going to find out who killed that person. But I realized afterwards, whoever did it might have been looking for me now, too. It's best not to say anything about my experience now while I'm still working as a ranger. Look, I don't know what happened, but here in Alaska at night, those skeletal remains still haunt me. I've never seen a cadaver at all, let alone in that bad condition. But all I can say is why didn't everybody just stay away from this area? Why did this happen? Who's this poor soul that got killed? It definitely looked malicious, like somebody had just left the body there. I mean, that's kind of obvious. Had it been an animal, it would have been eaten or torn apart or buried. But the body had been there for a while and there were no signs of any animals even touching it. How strange, almost paranormal if you will. My sighting happened in June of 2012. My father was undergoing chemo and I decided to bring him out canoeing for an afternoon trip. We headed down river to a secluded spot that we had been to once before. On our way there, my dog started acting funny, sniffing the ground and barking. That's when this large lizard thing began coming out of the trees. 
I began screaming, pointing at this creature, wondering what we were seeing. My father grabbed our canoe paddles and I began screaming for him to paddle us away. But this thing kept coming towards us. Now, it was slithering quickly through the water toward us like some big water snake. Not swimming, though. More flowing, until it was only about ten feet away from the canoe. Its head and body were above the water line. Then my dad reached in his pocket or something. I heard a gunshot go off, and a spray of blood shot out of this creature. The sight made me almost vomit. Then it just sank down under the water. I blacked out after that for some time in complete and utter terror. The next thing I know we are at our destination, and my father is asking if I'm okay. That's when he tells me what happened. I'm shooting this creature, and then this thing disappearing underneath the water, and I had fainted. I was so terrified. My dad explained to me something large had come through us and added the water. He wasn't sure what it was. My dad was pale. I mean, I've never seen him like that before. Now, fast forward 15 years later, and my oldest son believes he's seen a similar creature when he was out in the forest with his own friends. He was rounding up this group of kids when he saw something that looked like a lizard. He said it stared at him for a moment, and when they all became aware of what he was seeing, the creature darted off. My son, who is now 21, has never told anybody about this until I mentioned my own sighting to him, not knowing if it was the same thing. It's weird because his friends and parents had reported strange, large, three-toed tracks around their house at nighttime. They would find these large feces piles as well as large scratches along the house and trees. I can only suspect it's this thing hanging around here. Look, I don't know if we somehow stumbled upon its territory or what, but I know it's here. My son has also seen it several more times since his initial sighting. The last time was not too long ago. He said this thing is beginning to get very, very violent. It's been destroying people's property, attacking and killing dogs. I'm still in shock by what we all saw those years ago, and never once did I ever believe in this kind of thing until that day. Now, I know for sure it existed, and will continue to exist. I know I'm going to be attacked for what I'm saying, but if there's anybody else out there that has seen this thing, let me know. We need some answers. Halloween brings out the weirdos. We all know by now, right? The season seeps into their veins and compels them to act. They cause a scene in public. They catch your eye and make you wonder. Maybe they get behind the wheel and cause an accident. It's as common as it is frustrating. I work in a parking garage and even there I see all sorts. In the fall, a seasonal haunted house opens up across the street and it acts like a magnet for the strange and the curious. It takes a certain kind of person to want to be scared, you know? I never understood it personally. I never understood why you would want to feel your skin crawl. On this particular October night, my compliance didn't much matter. My normal night was determined to wilt and change. The quiet evening shed off its skin and transformed into something else before I could tell what was happening. From my seat behind the security monitors, I spotted a man wandering an empty floor of the garage. He was dressed uncharacteristically well for the area. I figured he was drunk and turned around, confused by the peculiar layout of the garage. That happened pretty often, you see. I don't know who built or designed the structure, but there were stairwells that only linked specific floors. Doors that seemed to lead nowhere. If you didn't follow the marked path, it was easy to get lost or confused. It happened to me the first few nights I worked there. You would guide a guest back to the safety of the street at least once a week. I made my way to the empty level of the garage and called out for the stranger. Now that I was on the floor, I couldn't see him. His only way out would have led him past me so I knew he hadn't escaped on his own. Where did he go? I checked around the support pillars and peeked into a few of the maintenance doors. There wasn't a man or woman to be found. I was alone. And then I wasn't. I turned around suddenly and saw him. He was standing in the middle of the garage exactly where I'd expected him the first time. 
Somehow I'd overlooked him on my approach. If he was there all along, I must have passed him at least three times as my search intensified. I called out again. This time my words made the stranger turn toward me. That's when I first saw the mask. His face still looked human enough, but his skin looked like it was covered in scales. His nose was flat and his lips were thin. He looked like something had stepped out of a science fiction show. I believed right away that he was an actor. He was supposed to be in the haunted house, I thought. Pre-gamed a little too early and wandered off of the beaten path. When I approached him, reaching out my hand to signal that I was there to help, he blinked. His eyelids moved from right to left. As his vision focused on me, I watched his eyes roll independently of one another. His gaze clicked onto my position one half at a time. Then his lips twitched up his face in a poor mockery of a smile. His teeth were short and looked like they'd been filed down. No man could have been born with teeth like that. I ignored the pit in my stomach and tried to swallow the anxious spit that had filled my mouth. I made a quick rationalization. It was a costume. The makeup or the prosthetics or whatever they were wearing, they were top of the line. I wouldn't know any differently, would I? I tried to open my mouth and return to the routine. Can I help you back to the street? Can I help you find your car? I stumbled over the words. And as I watched, staring at this man without so much as blinking or looking away, he changed. Those scales shimmered and started to take on a different color. Before a minute had passed, the ridges on his skin weren't so visible and the color was a lot closer to my own. His lips seemed to fill out and with a bit of effort, I could see him blinking normally, looking right like a man, except for the teeth that remained pointed. He changed almost completely, blended in. Is that why I didn't see him when I first reached that floor? Then the stranger mimicked my gesture from moments ago. He reached toward me. His body language said, let me help, but my mind was already screaming to run. I did exactly that. I got out of there as quickly as I could, all the way down and out juggling my cell phone and trying to call my co-workers. I couldn't stay there. I didn't. I tried explaining what I saw as I was leaving, but my peers were being a little too stubborn. Their minds were made up early on. They figured I was the one who'd gotten confused. I could tell that they were worried about me, but they weren't helping my situation. None of them saw the man that night. It was business as usual, or so they said. A couple weirdos coming to visit the haunted house, nothing more. But I knew better. I still know better. Maybe it isn't just the strange people that get called out by the autumn weather. Maybe it's just the strange in general. The most peculiar things that walk this earth. Like a man with lizard skin, with eyes that closed the wrong way, and teeth that were a little too sharp. What do you think? Have you ever seen something like that? Have you ever locked eyes with somebody and just knew that something was wrong with them? You'd know better than me, I guess. Did I imagine that? All right. Let me tell you a story that happened to me. I used to be buddies with this guy who had a massive fish farm down in Louisiana. I mean, this place was so big, it seemed like it went on forever. And it was right on the edge of the bayou. He had a bunch of fish ponds on his property, you know? The whole idea was to attract and keep fish for harvesting. People would pay good money to come and fish for a prize catch like a big old catfish or something. So his regular guy fell ill and he needed someone to take care of the place and make sure everything was running smooth. I said, sure, why not? And he brought me down there for a few days to help out. There were a bunch of ponds and several little huts scattered around the property. It was my job to check on the fish in the morning and the evening. The prize fish were tagged and the price he charged depended on the size of the fish. He had some real whoppers in there. One evening I'm doing my rounds, it's around 5 p.m. As the sun started to set, the feeding machines kicked in and started dropping food into the ponds. I started counting the fish as they came up to eat. The fish were done feeding just as the sun was going down. It was early winter and it got dark real quick. 
I was just about to wrap up for the night when I heard this splashing sound coming from behind one of the huts. I figured the fish were done eating, but maybe they were still hungry or something. I closed the hut door and peeked out the window to see if any fish were coming up to feed. I shined my flashlight out on the water to see if I could spot any ripples or anything, but I didn't see anything. The splashing got louder. I tried to look through the window again, but my flashlight was so dim it was useless. I had forgotten to charge it before I left and the battery was almost gone. Knowing I couldn't see anything, I figured I should just head back. But just as I was about to leave, I heard this strange gurgling sound. It wasn't like anything I did heard before. It was kind of high-pitched and, honestly, it sounded kind of scary. Whatever it was, it was outside the hut and sounded like it was swimming around in the pond. Now, I did heard tales of gators being spotted in the bayou, but those stories were few and far between. And this didn't sound like any gator I did ever heard. The sound would gurgle and then almost turn into a growl. So I figured I did just stay in the hut for a bit and not risk running into whatever was out there in the dark. I used to really enjoy helping my buddy out, but it felt like this time I did signed up for a bit more than I bargained for. As I sat in the hut, that strange sound seemed to be getting louder and I was getting more and more spooked. I tried to see what was going on outside, but it was tough to make anything out with the moon only half full. Then I saw something move. Something big was swimming around just outside the hut. I mean, it's hard to even believe what I'm about to tell you, even though I was the one who saw it. This thing, it was huge, like a good seven or eight feet long, and it looked, well, it didn't look normal. It was like a cross between a human and a gator, with a head that looked kind of like a snake. My heart was racing as I realized that I was dealing with something that didn't seem to belong in our world. I tried to keep calm while I watched the creature swim around the pond. I could make out its eyes that were glowing yellow in the dark. And I just knew. I just knew this thing was smart and I needed to stay sharp. It seemed to be searching for something and I had this feeling that if it found me, I would be in big trouble. As the hours ticked by, I stayed hunkered down inside the hut, hoping that the creature would eventually lose interest and leave. But I had this nagging feeling it knew I was there and I didn't know how much longer I could stay hidden. Man, I was kicking myself for not bringing a gun or something with me. Mostly I stayed hidden, but every now and then I would peek out. After what felt like forever, I saw it stop and start sniffing the water or something. Suddenly, something shot out from the reeds and started splashing around. I was frozen watching it and realized it was a nutria. The gator snake thing immediately sprang into action and went after the nutria. The poor thing was trying to escape, making all kinds of noise, and then... Nothing. All sounds stopped, and I'm sure it got caught. I didn't waste any time getting out of the hut and into my truck that was about a hundred feet away. I drove out of there like a bat out of hell. When I got to my cabin, I felt like I had run a marathon. I had one of the worst nights of my life just lying there, unable to sleep, going over and over in my mind what that thing could have been. All I wanted was to get as far away from that place as I could. Come morning, I was out of there. I called my buddy and told him I didn't know what the hell was in his pond, but I wasn't going to stick around to find out. I left that place and haven't been back since. Alright, let's get the show on the road. I don't want to spill too many beans here. You never know who's watching or listening. The world got a taste of the unknown when those UFO tapes hit the news a while back. If the big wigs in their high towers can stomach that, I reckon this won't cause much of a stir. So for the purpose of this little chat, let's say my name's Doe, John Doe. Back in my younger years, around 2015 to 2020, I served my time in the US Army spent most of it stationed in the arid landscapes of the Middle East. My role? Nothing you'd laid home about, but important nonetheless. I was a signal support system specialist, a fancy title for someone who ensures communication lines are up and running. We were holed up in one of those forward operating base in the heart of Afghanistan. 
The place was no paradise, but it was home for a time. You learned to appreciate the little things like a warm meal or a night without mortar fire. I always had an affinity for the nights there. The desert has a way of making the stars seem brighter, more alive. One of those nights I was on radio duty overseeing the communication. Just as the monotony was starting to set in, a crackle came through the speakers. Not unusual. The desert plays tricks on the equipment. But then, it was followed by a voice. A pilot, flying a routine surveillance mission, spoke in rushed, hushed tones. He'd spotted something, something that didn't belong in the Afghani night sky. The initial reaction was a possible enemy aircraft. We were in a war zone, after all. I reported the chatter to my commanding officer, and within minutes, the forward operating base was buzzing with activity. But it wasn't panic. It was more of an eerie anticipation. You see, this wasn't a conventional aircraft, according to our pilot. It was something else. I managed to catch a glimpse of the sky through the slit in our communications tent. There it was. A bright, pulsating light. Unnatural. Unearthly. It hung in the sky, almost mocking us with its presence. It darted around in ways that defied logic, as if the laws of physics were suggestions rather than rules. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it shot off into the night, leaving a trail of light that lingered for a few moments before fading away. We were left in a state of stunned silence. Even the desert seemed quieter as if holding its breath. The rest of the night was a whirlwind. System checks, radar sweeps, debriefings. The official line was an unidentified aerial phenomenon, but we knew better. Now I'm not saying it was aliens, but it was something. Something we couldn't explain. Something that still gives me chills when I think about it. After the initial shock wore off, life at the forward operating base resumed its usual pace. But the atmosphere had changed. That night had introduced an undercurrent of unease. We still did our jobs, kept up the patrols, and maintained the equipment. But every light in the sky brought a moment of silence, a collective holding of breath. A few days later I was on night shift again. The base was quiet, most of the guys catching some shut-eye. Suddenly the radio crackled to life. It was our pilot, the same one from the other night. He was on another routine flyover when he spotted it again. The light. This time he was ordered to approach. I could hear the reluctance in his voice, but he followed orders. As he got closer, his commentary became more sporadic. Words like impossible and not natural floated through the communication. Then without warning, his feed went dead. The silence that followed was deafening. The commanding officer barked orders. A scramble was initiated, but it was too late. Our pilot was gone. His last known coordinates showed him over an empty stretch of desert. We spent the next few days scouring the desert, but there was no sign of him or the aircraft. It was as if they had vanished into thin air. Eventually, we had to give up the search. The official report stated that the pilot had crashed due to equipment failure. But we knew better. We knew what had really happened. I left the army not long after that. The incident shook me, made me question things I'd always taken for granted. It's been years, but I still find myself looking up at the night sky, wondering. Months later, I was back stateside, my tour of duty over. But the memories of that night in the desert stayed with me, haunting my dreams and filling my waking hours with questions. I tried to get back to normal life, but normal felt like a foreign concept. One night, I found myself sitting alone in my apartment, the television droning on in the background. I was lost in my thoughts when a news report caught my attention. It was about those UFO videos that had been making the rounds on the internet. The reporter was interviewing some high-ranking official who was spewing the usual government line, weather balloons, atmospheric phenomena, you know the drill. But then, they showed one of the videos. It was grainy, taken from the cockpit of a military aircraft, but there was no mistaking what I was seeing. That same unnatural light, moving in ways that defied explanation. A shiver ran down my spine. It was them. I was sure of it. 
From that moment on, I knew I couldn't ignore it any longer. I started researching, reaching out to others who had seen similar things. I even attended a few meetings of UFO enthusiasts, although most of them seemed more interested in conspiracy theories than actual evidence. But every now and then I'd meet someone like me, someone who had seen things they couldn't explain. We'd exchange stories, offer each other support, and try to make sense of our experiences. It was comforting in a way to know I wasn't alone. And so I find myself here, sharing my story with you. I don't know if it'll make a difference. I don't know if anyone will even believe me. But I had to get it out. It's part of my healing process, I guess. All right, so... I used to help this buddy of mine with his property in the Florida Everglades every now and then. This wasn't your everyday property, mind you. It was a gigantic gator farm, smack dab in the middle of nowhere. I think he's got about 500 acres, give or take, all swamp and marshlands, and it's so far out it's practically in Cuba. Now he's got about a dozen gator ponds scattered across his property. If you ain't familiar with gator farming, the whole idea is to breed them, raise them, and then sell them. People pay top dollar for gator meat, and even more for the hides. Anyway, long story short, his farm hand up and quits one day, and he needed some help running the place. So I thought, why not? And I ended up down there for a couple weeks. There were 12 gator ponds and 12 watchtowers across his farm, all of them filled with these massive, scary-looking gators. Part of my job was to do a head count every morning and evening, make sure none of them had wandered off or eaten each other. Every gator was tagged and tracked, and the price my buddy got for each one depended on their size and age. He had some real monsters in those ponds, let me tell you. One evening I'm making my rounds about 6 p.m., just as the sun's starting to go down. The ponds are quiet, the gators are all settling in for the night. I'm counting heads, making sure everyone's accounted for. Just as I'm finishing up, the sun sets and it gets real dark real fast. You know how it is in the winter, sun goes down early, and there I am, in the middle of the Everglades, surrounded by gators, in the pitch black. I was about to call it a night when I heard this strange noise coming from behind one of the towers. Now, gators make all sorts of noises, but this, this was different. It wasn't the usual low grumble of a gator. It was something else, something I'd never heard before. I tried to shine my flashlight out towards the noise, see if I could catch any eye shine in the swamp, but I didn't see anything. I thought maybe my mind was playing tricks on me, but then the noise got louder. I tried to shine my light again, but it was too dim to see anything. I'd forgotten to charge it and the battery was about to die. I was standing there in the dark, in the middle of a gator farm, with some strange noise getting louder and louder. Just when I was about to say forget it and leave, I heard it again, louder this time, and it definitely wasn't a gator. It was this eerie humming sound, vibrating the air around me, and it sounded threatening in a way I can't really explain. Whatever was making that noise, it was out there in the dark, moving around, and it wasn't a gator. Now I've heard stories about things in the Everglades, stories about big cats, panthers, things like that. But this didn't sound like any cat I've ever heard. The sound was like a vibration, and then it would turn into a kind of hissing noise. I decided right then and there to stay put in the tower and not risk running into whatever was out there in the dark. I always enjoyed helping my friend with his farm, but that night, I got more than I bargained for. As I sat there in the tower, that strange sound was getting louder and louder, and I was getting more and more freaked out. I tried to look out into the darkness, but with the moon just a sliver in the sky, it was almost impossible to see anything. But then, I saw something. Something moving just outside the tower. Now I know this is going to sound nuts even to me, and I was the one who saw it. The thing moving around was massive, easily seven or eight feet tall, and it didn't look like anything I'd ever seen before. It looked like a cross between a human and, I don't know, some kind of prehistoric animal. It had a head that looked like a snake's. 
My heart was pounding so hard I could hear it in my ears. I was looking at something that didn't belong in this world. Not in any world I knew, at least. I tried to keep my breathing steady while I watched this creature moving back and forth out there in the dark. Its eyes were glowing, a sickly yellow color, and even though I couldn't see much else, I knew this thing was smart and dangerous. It was searching for something, and I had a sinking feeling that something was me. As the minutes turned into hours, I stayed hidden in the tower, praying this creature would lose interest and move on. But I had a feeling it knew I was there, and I didn't know how much longer I could stay hidden. I was kicking myself for not bringing a gun with me. I stayed crouched down, only daring to peek out every once in a while. After what felt like an eternity, I saw it stop and start sniffing the air. That's when something shot out from the undergrowth and started squealing. It was a wild boar and the creature went after it like a bolt of lightning. The poor thing was squealing like mad and then… silence. It had been caught. I took that opportunity to make a run for it. To my truck parked about 100 yards away and I drove out of there like the devil himself was chasing me. When I finally got back to my room, I was completely drained. I spent the rest of the night wide awake, going over and over in my mind what I'd seen, what it could have been. All I knew was, I wanted to get as far away from that place as possible. The next morning I called my friend and told him, look, I don't know what the heck is on your property but I ain't sticking around to find out. So I left. I packed up my stuff and I drove away from that place as fast as I could. And let me tell you, I haven't been back since. I don't know what that thing was, and I don't really want to know. All I know is, it's something I don't ever want to run into again. I mean, I've seen a lot of things in my life, but that was something else. Something from a nightmare. And it wasn't just the sight of it, it was the feeling it gave me. Like I was prey, you know? Like I was being hunted. But anyway, that's my story. I don't know if you believe it or not, but it's true. Every word of it. You can choose to believe me or not, but I know what I saw. And I know I don't ever want to see it again. So, I had this buddy named Dale. He used to live in the bustling city of Chicago. But he decided to move out to the wilds of Alaska. The nature, the wildlife, the fresh air and all that, you know? Now, Dale, he'd always been a city boy. So, moving to a cabin in Alaska, that was a whole new world for him. His uncle had left him this cabin in his will. Dale thought it was a good chance to start fresh, you know. So, he packed up his life, left his job, said goodbye to the Chicago deep dish pizzas, and off he went. He'd visited the cabin a few times before, of course. Every now and then when he got some vacation time. But living there? That was a whole other story. When Dale got there, it was pretty much how he remembered it. The log cabin, the lake nearby, the dense forest around. He started settling in, getting the cabin up and running. One thing Dale loved about the cabin was the beautiful view of the lake. He'd sit on the porch, drink his coffee, and just watch the stillness of the water. It was peaceful. But one day he noticed something off. There were usually ducks and other birds on the lake. That day, though, it was empty. Quiet. Like they'd all decided to take a vacation or something. He shrugged it off. Probably just a bad day for the birds or something, he thought. The next day, Dale noticed the same thing. No ducks, no birds, nothing. The lake was still as glass. That was strange. It got him thinking, got him worrying. He felt something was off but couldn't quite put his finger on it. Dale decided to walk around the lake, see if he could find any signs of what was going on. That's when he noticed these weird tracks. Kind of like a bird's tracks, but much bigger. And claws. Like a big bird. A really big bird. Dale got back to the cabin and couldn't help but think. Get a camera. He remembered his buddy from Chicago saying once when they were discussing wildlife spotting. He found an old one in his uncle's stuff. He'd used it for hunting or something. He decided to set up the camera near the lake. By the time he was done, it was getting late. He headed back to the cabin. 
The next morning, he went out to the lake. The camera was knocked over. The tracks were there again. But this time, there was something else. Feathers. Big black feathers. And lots of them. Dale felt a chill run down his spine. He picked up the camera and headed back to the cabin. He had a feeling that he was about to discover something. Something big. So, Dale, he gets back to the cabin. He hooks up the camera to his laptop. He's not exactly tech savvy, but he manages. The camera had a bit of footage before it got knocked over. Now, the footage. It was all normal at first. The still lake, the occasional gust of wind. But then, late at night, something appeared. It was big. It moved like a bird, but it was too big to be a bird. It seemed to be looking for something around the lake. And then, it got closer to the camera. And then, bam, the screen goes blank. The camera was knocked over. But Dale, he managed to freeze the frame just before the camera got knocked over. And what he saw, it sent chills down his spine. The creature, it had the face of a bird, a beak. But it also had these shark teeth and the eyes. They were glowing, even in the black and white footage. Dale sat there staring at the frozen image. He didn't know what to think. He didn't know what to do. He was a city boy after all. This was way out of his league. Dale finally shook himself out of it. He decided he had to do something. He couldn't just sit there and do nothing. He decided to call the local wildlife officer. Someone who might know what this creature was. Or at least he hoped they would. Dale tried to explain what he saw. The big bird-like creature, the tracks, the feathers. He sent them the footage. The wildlife officer was stumped too. He'd never seen anything like it. He promised to look into it and let Dale know if he found anything. That night, Dale couldn't sleep. He kept thinking about the creature, the big bird with teeth. He wondered if it would come back. He wondered what it wanted. And then, he heard it. A loud, strange call. It was coming from the lake. So, Dale, he hears this call. It's unlike anything he's ever heard before. Like a bird screech, but deeper. More ominous. He couldn't just sit there. He grabs a flashlight and steps outside. The night was darker than usual. Clouds blocking out the moonlight. He walks towards the lake, the call getting louder. As he nears the lake, he sees it. The creature, it's there, just by the water's edge. It was bigger than he'd thought, taller than him even. Its feathers were black, shiny under the weak flashlight. It turned around and Dale, he couldn't help but freeze. It was the creature from the footage, but seeing it up close, it was much more terrifying. The beak, the teeth, the glowing eyes. Dale slowly backed away, not taking his eyes off the creature. It seemed to be watching him, curious, but it didn't move towards him. Dale made it back to the cabin, his heart pounding. He spent the night awake, listening to the creature's call, wondering what it was, what it wanted. The next day, Dale decided to head into town. He needed to talk to someone, the wildlife officer, or anyone who would listen. In town, folks looked at him like he was crazy. A giant bird creature in their small, quiet town? He couldn't blame them. He would have thought the same. If he hadn't seen it with his own eyes, days turned into weeks. Dale kept seeing the creature. At night by the lake, it never threatened him. Just stayed by the lake, doing whatever it was doing. Dale didn't understand it but he decided to coexist. He started to document the creature, its habits, its calls. He even gave it a name, Ravenous. After its raven-like appearance, he started to feel less afraid, more curious. What was Ravenous? Why was it here? Was it alone? So many questions. Dale knew he was in the middle of something big, something most people wouldn't believe. But he had the proof. The footage, the photos, the giant bird creature of the Alaskan lake. Ravenous. 
he decided to share his discovery. He reached out to wildlife experts, bird watchers, anyone who might be interested. He knew it would be hard for people to believe him, but he had to try. So Dale, he's reaching out to all these people. He's sharing his story, his footage, his observations. He's hoping someone would take him seriously, but all he gets are dismissals. He gets responses, sure, but they're all the same. It's probably a hoax. It's just a large bird, nothing more. Stop wasting our time. It was disheartening. Alright, so this takes us back to the late 80s. I was just starting out as a young cop in this small Midwest town. Kind of the place where everyone knew everyone, you know? I was renting this little one-bedroom place in the heart of town. Now, it wasn't anything fancy, but it was home, and I loved it. So one day I get this letter in the mail from the landlord. It turns out he's selling the building, and I've got a month to find a new place. You can imagine how that felt. I was panicking. Didn't know where to look. And then, there was Joe. This old-timer at the station who heard about my situation. He told me about this vacant house down the road that was owned by his cousin. Said it was in a rough state but I could live there rent-free if I fixed it up. I was desperate, so I decided to take him up on his offer. And boy, he wasn't kidding about the house being in a rough state. It looked like something straight out of a horror movie. But you know, there was something about it. It had character. I decided to roll up my sleeves and get to work. A few weeks in, I meet my neighbor, this old lady named Edna. She was kind of peculiar, always kept to herself, but she had this huge, fenced-off backyard that she never used. It was always so quiet over there. Then one night, I'm up late, working on the house, and I hear this strange noise coming from Edna's yard. I ignored it at first, but it kept going, so I decided to check it out. It was late, you know, around midnight. The town was quiet, but this noise, it was unlike anything I'd ever heard. So curiosity got the best of me. I decided to go over and see what was going on. As I walked towards Edna's fence, the sounds got louder. It was a growl, but not like a dog or a bear. This was deeper. It sounded ancient, like something from a time long gone. I reached the fence and peered over. The yard was dark, except for this dim light coming from a small shed in the corner. And in that dim light, I saw it. This massive, hulking figure hunched over something. This creature. I can't even begin to describe it. It was like some kind of reptilian humanoid. Its skin was scaly and rough, gleaming under the dim light. But its face. It was almost human-like, but warped. Twisted. Its eyes, they were this deep, fiery red. They glowed in the darkness, giving off this eerie light. When it heard me, it stopped what it was doing and looked up. It had this look. It was almost like it was annoyed at being disturbed. Its eyes narrowed and it gave this low hiss. And then it started to stand up. I swear to you, it must have been at least seven feet tall. I could see its muscular body covered in those thick scales. It looked right at me, its eyes burning with a primal rage. I could see its sharp claws glistening in the light. For a moment, time stood still. It was just me and this creature staring each other down. I was petrified. My heart was beating so fast I thought it was going to burst out of my chest. Then it let out this roar. It was deafening. It echoed through the night, shaking me to my core. I stumbled back, my heart pounding. I turned and ran into my house, slamming the door behind me. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept replaying the encounter in my head. The sight of that creature. It was like something out of a nightmare. I went over to Edna's the next day and she had no idea what happened. There was nothing in her backyard. I must have checked ten times that day. So I ended up doing a little digging. Turns out Edna's house was owned by her son who lived out of state. He had no idea what was going on either. I told him about the creature and he was as shocked as I was. The next month, Edna was gone. Her son came and cleaned out the house. They never found any creature, though. 
the house was sold and the new owners completely renovated the place. But to this day, I'll never forget that creature in Edna's backyard. It's one of those things that stays with you. I loved my car. I'm not sure how vain that makes me sound at the start of this story, but it's the truth. In fact, a few years ago, the only thing I would have said I loved more than my car was life itself. Can't drive if you're dead, right? I never thought I'd have to choose between the two. My 1960 Cadillac Sedan DeVille with its dropped suspension and black chrome accessories or my actual life. I'm embarrassed to say it, but the choice wasn't easy. Watching a monster tear apart the vehicle I'd pour my sweat, time, and savings into was probably harder than dying. I guess I'll never know for sure. The Cadillac helped me stand out from the rest of the rural Arizona community. It was part of a lifestyle and aesthetic that I guess I inherited from my father, who brought his particular taste to the farmland after moving from Los Angeles. Maybe I valued that even more than the Chrome. That vehicle kept me connected to my dad. When it died, it was like losing him all over again. But I'm getting too sentimental. This story isn't about my father or the connection we failed to rebuild while he was still around. This story is about the beast. My neighbors are all miles away. We don't talk often, not unless there's an emergency. I heard whispers from them on a trip to town, rumors that the family to the south of my land had seen a strange animal skirting the edge of their pond. It was a hot summer, I told myself. Any creature with a tongue would be stopping by that pond as it was the only source of fresh water for quite some distance. I didn't expect the opossums or the wild dogs to have a real grasp of drawing water from a well. They did describe the animal in a peculiar, though. They called it a naked bear. Now I'd seen pictures of starved and diseased bears online, so the image came to mind very quickly. But bears weren't exactly common in our area. I couldn't imagine what one would have been doing on our land. Looking back, I think it was just lost. Certainly that happens on rare occasion, right? I didn't take any stock in those stories. I went home as usual, parked my car in the usual spot in the shade of an old maple tree, and didn't bother to roll the windows. When the forecast was clear, I never did. But I woke that night to the sound of the Cadillac's horn blaring. It bleated once and twice, loud enough both times to stir me from my bedroom and then fell silent. I thought it might be some kids messing around with the car, so I ran out quickly and unprepared. But it wasn't a kid in my car. It was an animal that had scratched and clawed its way up and through the open window, crammed its sickly thin body through the narrow space just to get a closer look at the leather interior. I caught its body in the beam of my flashlight, and I froze. It wasn't a naked bear, but I did understand the comparisons. It was the size of a large dog. Maybe it would have been bigger if it had any meat on its bones, and it did have a head that was vaguely ursine. The issue was the spines on its back, long and raised in a single row like a mohawk of bones. The issue was its tube-shaped tongue which I saw unfurl and flop from its mouth like a butterfly's proboscis. The issue was its feet, which ended universally in sharp claws too long and too straight for any animal I'd ever known. They grew like knives instead of fingernails. They were knives which, at the present moment, were slicing through my seats like butter. I gasped and lurched forward and thought to open the door and start wrestling with the thing. The boils on its back made me pause. It wasn't a bear, but it was sick. Lesions grew around its shoulder blades and its strange tongue was thick with a yellow mucus-like spit. I didn't want to deal with any part of that. Instead, I watched. It was burrowing into the seats like a squirrel carving out its next hiding place. Maybe it was building a nest, somewhere safe and warm for the night. I stood there with my heart in my throat until an idea came to mind. The inside of the car was ruined by then, but maybe I could still get the monster off of my property. I ran back inside and grabbed my keys, triggering the alarm on the Cadillac. The car wailed in a deafening blinking pattern. 
I couldn't help but think of it as the death throes of my lovely little vehicle. The shrieking was enough to send the monster into a frenzy. It jerked around the interior before spilling back out of the window and rolling to its feet. I watched it run clear off of my property, and then I stood and waited again. That time I was waiting for sunrise. I needed to assess the damage but couldn't bring myself to do it with only a torch to light my way. When dawn broke, I cried. The interior could be replaced. The stink of the creature's saliva could have been washed out with enough attempts and enough conviction. The doors, where its claws had cleaved into the metal, could have been swapped for assembly line parts. But I felt like I was looking at a corpse. I loved that car. I wanted to protect it as though it was the last memory of my father, and instead I'd let it be destroyed. I parked it in a barn and left it there. Finding the monster became my priority, but I've never had success. The sick bear or the dog with the butterfly tongue, whatever you want to call it, have you seen it? Because I owe that creature a world of punishment for the damage it did that night. As a park ranger, every once in a while you come across a piece of abandoned property. It isn't uncommon. Things get left behind. Things get dumped in the shadowy place where no one thinks they'll be found. Most often you collect the property, try to contact the owners, and ultimately dispose of it. In some cases, however, you have to do a little more. There are certain items that demand more of you when you find them discarded on the trail. I came across a bicycle one afternoon. Adult size, rigged to make easy work of the sharp turns and winding hills of the dirt that cut through the forest. It was overturned on the side of the path. The weeds underneath its steel frame were reaching up from below it, coiling around the body of the bicycle like fingers trying to drag the structure back into the dirt. It had been there a while, I knew that. But aside from the dried mud on the tires, the bike looked brand new. They wouldn't have just left it. I called back to my peers over the radio and began to investigate, stepping over the bike and into the woods. There was a chance they'd left the trail for some reason and become lost, trapped, or injured. I called out, sharing my identity and scanning the brush for any signs of movement. The area became quiet. On the trail, I hadn't noticed it, but the moment I stepped off, it seemed like the ambient sounds of the forest had died down. I think in the moment my adrenaline was too high for my mind to register what was happening. I was too focused on the task at hand, saving a life. When a sound finally did penetrate that wall of silence though, it wasn't at all what I was looking for. It was a howl, long-winded and bone-chilling. It penetrated straight through the goosebumps rising on my skin and sunk down into my very core. I was suddenly uncomfortably aware of my own heartbeat. I felt every thud in my chest, felt the pulsing in my ears and skull. The howl wasn't like anything I'd heard before. My training took over, my responsibility to the individual who was probably lost in the forest around me. That's what kept me from running, at least at first. Then, the creature emerged from the wilderness. It stepped out from behind a tree, as if it had been hiding there and watching me. Its body was long and slender, probably six feet from foot to shoulder. It looked like a dog or a wolf, massive and sickly. There were patches where its fur had gone missing, scars where it had tangled with something I can't imagine survived. It was an animal. I knew that much. Then it stood on its hind legs and everything I knew fell apart. It stood like a man and glared at me like I was going to be the next thing stuck between its teeth. I believed it. So I ran. I tore my way back to the trail and lifted the bike from the weeds. I heard the plant life snap, each of the earth's fingers breaking as I ripped the frame back upright. I didn't think I could outrun the monster, but maybe this would work. I pedaled as quickly as I could and prayed that the chain and tires were still properly aligned. If the bike had been discarded as damaged goods, I was doomed. Lucky for me, it was holding up. I was confident that I'd left the monster behind. I was already breathing lighter. I didn't slow down, but I did risk a glance behind me. 
My eyes didn't even make it that far. It was beside the bike. Running full speed, easily in pace with my pedaling, destroying every branch and bush in its way. I tried to yell, gasp, anything. I opened my mouth to scream, but it was already crashing into me. It slammed shoulder first into my side and sent me reeling. My face hit the ground first. I tasted dirt and grass and the blood already flowing between my teeth. My body rag dulled and rolled, tying up in knots before I landed several feet off of the trail. I was face up, squinting at the sky peeking back at me from beyond the tops of the trees. I knew surer than anything else that the monster was coming my way. I was going to be eaten, but the bite never came. The teeth and tongue never lashed my body. I was able to pull myself up somehow. The bike was ruined. The second crash on the trail was apparently too much for it to bear. The frame was twisted and the front tire was bent. There was no sign of my attacker, except for the patch of hair caught on the bicycle spokes. I grabbed that, thinking it would be my saving grace. It would prove that I wasn't crazy. More important, at least at the time, I thought it would be enough evidence to encourage the rest of the rangers to search for the original owner of the bike. When I brought it back and told my story, there were some snickers, but they ultimately decided to test the hair to see where it came from. The last thing I expected was for those results to come back human. The texture was all wrong, and I knew the beast I'd seen wasn't anything close to human. How was it possible then? How could that have been the evidence that peeled off of the beast's body? It didn't make sense to me then and it doesn't make sense to me now. Unfortunately, the rangers felt the same way. Efforts to find the missing person if they even existed were minimal. Efforts to track the monsters were non-existent. It was never found and thus far never seen again. But what do you think? Is there a chance it turns back up? Is there a chance that the thing I saw was really just a man? We've all got a weird story, right? You've got one, don't you? I think everyone sees something they can't explain at least once in their life. Maybe for the most part that happens when we're young. We come to terms with the encounter after telling ourselves that our undeveloped minds just didn't know how to process something. We invented an outlandish memory or worse, deleted the experience from our minds entirely. Sometimes it happens after we've grown. We keep the story to ourselves or entrust it to our close friends. We share snippets of it with a therapist and listen closely as the encounter is broken down into more digestible parts. You agree with all that, don't you? Or am I just projecting? I thought that might be the case. Encounter. Kind of gives that away, doesn't it? Encounter says I met something and not all of these stories begin like that. That is how my story begins. I met something. And that experience was in no way digestible, not before or after the therapy. You see, I have a lot of trust in my own mind. I had to. My line of work was intimately entwined with fields like physics and aerodynamics. I signed too many documents to say outright what kind of work I did, but I think you can imagine the usefulness of a mind like mine. You can imagine how an individual or an organization might want to apply those fields of study to the practical world. You've got it, don't you? Good. Anyway, I learned to trust my mind. It was greatest muscle, refined and strengthened by years of study and application. To think that I just imagined the things I saw, well, that's preposterous. One night I arrived home from work to find a cloud sitting above my home. It was too high in the atmosphere to be considered a blanket of fog, but it was low enough to appear strangely centered over my single-story suburban house. I looked at it, tilted my head, wondered aloud if the weather was going to take a turn for the worse, and then I forgot all about it. The low-hanging black cloud. My therapist would say that my memory was painting that moment to be more colorful than it could have been, more theatrical and exciting. The black cloud was a visual metaphor that I invented, according to them. It symbolizes the trauma, the looming dread. I remember taking off my coat that night. I remember washing the dishes from breakfast that morning and taking a shower before bed. 
I remember pulling the blanket up to my shoulder. Then I remember the sound of metal scraping against metal. I remember the tug of restraints around my wrists and ankles. They felt like warm leather, like a belt that had been laid out in the sun. I remember the cold, hard table underneath my back. I remember the bright lights blinking on and off overhead, playing with my senses like the poking of a stick. I remember the smell of chlorine and the faint burn that spread across my skin. I remember when the creatures stepped into frame. They sauntered into my peripheral vision and settled overhead. They were on top of me, looking down like a dentist white peer into an open mouth. I didn't feel any pain. I only felt the terror. I felt immeasurable fear as their large black eyes peered down at me. It seemed as though my body was being pulled in different directions like they'd cut me open to puppeteer my bones. I was a little marionette on that table, dancing whichever way the creatures demanded. Their skin was gray. Their heads were engorged, swollen like water balloons. Their lips were thin and pressed shut throughout the entirety of the encounter. They never spoke. They never needed to. They seemed to communicate silently. I wondered if their mouths were so small for the same reasons that mankind's pinky fingers had shrunk over the years. They didn't need them anymore. They had a better way of speaking and a better way of breathing. I fixated on that question instead of on what was happening to my body. I couldn't endure that vulnerability. I couldn't bring myself to acknowledge that I had no idea what these creatures were doing to me. The lights blinked. I felt them swimming in my organs. Then I remember waking up in my bed. The interior of my house was destroyed, as if every piece of furniture had been raised to the ceiling and then dropped back down. I called my peers and not the police. I trusted the tests that they would perform more than what might be done at a hospital. They never let me see the results. They never let me resume my work either. Eventually, I shared that tragedy with my friends. I shared with my therapist, like I said. They all have their theories. I invented the story to cope with the collapse of my career. I imagined the strange encounter when in reality someone very human had forced their way into my home and antagonized me while they were there. My favorite theory is that I'm willfully lying. Imagine that, will you? I'm so bored with my life that I've invented an excuse for everyone to call me a liar. I've purposefully given the world a reason to distrust me. I wish that were the case. I wish I could dismiss what happened as a dream. I wish I didn't still see that black cloud sometimes, hovering somewhere in the distance. I wonder if it's watching me, or if it's moved on to someone else. Maybe I'm just seeing the next place it plans to attack. Maybe I should be warning people of what's to come when the storm cloud parks itself just above your roof. Maybe, but maybe not. What do you think? What responsibility do I have now after being turned away as a liar? I always thought I was lucky to have a son who took an interest in my work. I didn't find the life of a park ranger to be particularly glamorous, so when he started asking questions about my job, I was surprised. It wasn't long after that when we started camping together, going on hikes, and immersing ourselves in the wilderness. I shared my knowledge as best I could. I taught him how to spot tracks in the spring and summer. I taught him how to build a fire in the fall and winter. He was prepared, I thought, although I didn't know exactly what for. Maybe he'd follow in my footsteps and spend his weeks patrolling our nation's great national parks. Maybe he'd pass that knowledge down to his own kids when the time came. I was wrong about a lot of things. He wasn't prepared, not really, and neither of us were lucky. When the thing in the woods crossed our path, each of us realized just how dangerous these parks really are. There are no manuals, no amount of training, and no weapons that can prepare you for the secrets Mother Nature still hides. We were setting up camp. Dusk was fast approaching. We'd picked out a pretty clear spot surrounded by fir trees. There weren't any tracks nearby and there were no signs of nesting, either in our area or in a 15-foot radius around our site. We thought we were in the clear. 
we'd be lucky to see a passing deer. Before we could even erect our tents though, the knocking started. We listened at first, trying to silently decide if we were hearing something natural. Sometimes you'll hear a buck grinding their antlers against a smaller tree. This sound was more unique. It was rhythmic. There was an undeniable pattern to it. Something intelligent. It wasn't Morse code, but it felt similar. Like the distant knocks were speaking in a language that we just didn't know. So we called out. We went looking. My son was 13 and intelligent enough to hang back or to run if he needed to. But we were both convinced that we were hearing the efforts of a man or woman stuck in the area nearby. They could have been trapped, injured, or malnourished. They couldn't speak, that much was clear, but we believed they were asking for help. The average person wouldn't know Morse code. They'd just be making whatever noises they could to get somebody's attention. They had our attention, at least. But they weren't human. We agreed on the direction the sounds were coming from, and we moved toward it. After walking maybe a dozen feet outside of our camp's perimeter, the knocking abruptly ended. We heard something scrape past the trees, like thick fur tangling in dry branches. That sound passed us like birds on the wind, quick and fluttering. We tried to turn our heads and follow the sounds as they ran around us, but we couldn't make out the shape of whatever was out there. It was moving too quickly to be a man. We stood back to back, turning in a circle to keep our eyes on the woods. I remember seeing goosebumps on my son's arms. They matched the hairs standing up on my own neck. We both felt the same way. We'd stumbled into a trap of some kind. We were being hunted. Our only chance, I thought, was to make ourselves look big. Don't show any fear. Make it look like the meat on our bones wouldn't be worth the fight. Then my son spotted the thing in the trees. He screamed and pointed. My eyes followed his finger. It was twice the size of either of us. Approaching eight feet tall with a hunch in its back that meant it was probably even taller. Standing on two feet. Covered in the exact fur that I had imagined, thick and matted and the color of the autumn leaves. I'd never seen an animal so wide. My son and I, standing shoulder to shoulder, barely matches the width of its chest. It stood there, half hidden by the fur, and just watched. It glared at us, chewing on its lip like a daydreaming child. Its brow jutted out and its forehead was tall and narrow. It looked like an ape of some kind. Its long arms nearly scraped the ground even from its upright position. It was hard not to imagine those arms tearing through the trees around us. Our bodies would break even easier than that. It took in one more big breath, filling its lungs to the brim. I flinched when I thought it might roar. But then the beast turned and ran away. It disappeared back into the woods, leaving both of us with wide eyes and open mouths. That was the first time my son asked a question about the woods that I couldn't answer. That was the first time I even considered that we might be in danger out there in the trees. How could we prepare for that? How could we sleep soundly, knowing that it was out there watching us? That night, we didn't. We packed up and drove all night to crawl back into our own beds. We haven't gone camping since either. We haven't visited the trails. Unfortunately for me, I haven't seen the beast again, even after volunteering for more work with the parks. I wanted to get a picture of it. I wanted to have evidence that someone could point to and proclaim, I know what that is. After that, I figured I might feel safe again. I might go back out there with my kid. The woods might be our special place again, but I'm starting to think that will never happen. There are no answers for these kinds of things, are there? There's no one coming along to explain what we encountered. You haven't seen it, have you? You don't have the proof that I need, do you? These stories always take place on land, don't they? That's how I always hear them, at least. Chased through the woods, watched through the windows. I've dealt with things on land. Wild dogs with the taste of your skin on their mind. People pushed past their limits and looking for a way out. I've seen a lot of things on the force. Most of them I handled well. 
Some of them I wasn't quite trained for. My real problem was the day that I encountered something on the lake. How do you stop something when it's coming from beneath you? How do you escape it when it already has you surrounded? I'll jump ahead and spoil the ending since I'm sure you've already guessed. I didn't stop the monster that day. I didn't escape it either. I used to spend my days off at the lake, sometimes on the shore, sometimes in my boat. No matter what, the hours always passed a little easier when there was a fishing pole in my hands. I don't remember catching anything on that particular day. I remember the water being still, actually. It was like I'd driven across the surface of a mirror. The only thing moving in that lake, at least at first, was my reflection. Then something knocked against my boat. Rocked the whole thing from side to side nearly made me drop my pole. What was it? I was coming up empty as far as explanations were concerned. I looked over the edge expecting to see a log or something bobbing underneath the surface. Sometimes a storm would uproot a tree and send the whole thing sliding into our lake. It had float there just out of sight until tangling with some fisherman's line or knocking on the underside of a vessel. That wasn't the case. There was nothing in the water, nothing that I could see. Whatever had brushed my boat had already swam away. I should have been afraid that very moment. Instead, I was excited. I thought maybe I'd drifted onto the path of a gar or a sturgeon. That meant there was something here for me to catch. Little did I know, I was the one on the line. I watched the surface of the lake even closer than before. That's the thing about fishing. You aren't always hunting with your eyes. Sometimes you're waiting for the tug of the line or the sound of the pole shifting in its stand. I needed to see it, though. If I could set my eyes on it, I could wrangle it. I could lug it up the shore and take one of those pictures with the freshwater monster in my hands. But I didn't see a fish. I saw a blur. I saw the gray shift of some unintelligible shape far below the surface of the water too far beyond the rays of the sun for my eyes to decipher what it was. I could only tell that it was big. Big and fast, but strangely agile. Something as large as the shape I saw moving underneath the lake should have disturbed the water a great deal. It barely budged. When the amorphous gray movement disappeared somewhere lower in the water, I felt the anxiety finally creeping into my bones the cold sweat on the back of my neck and the sinking feeling in my stomach. Something was very wrong here. If the fish weren't out today, I shouldn't have been either. I turned to activate the motor and head back to shore. Suddenly the boat lurched again, this time rolling across the water and dumping me into the depths. Something callous and rigid scraped across my leg. I felt it even through my pants. I hurried to orient myself to remember which way was up. I unlaced my boots and kicked them off before the steel toes could drag me down any further. I started swimming. I couldn't believe how far down the momentum had dragged me. And then the shape passed overhead. It blacked out the blinking light of the sun passing through the water. It enveloped me completely in darkness. I could barely make out the shape of fins ahead of me. Each one was at least two feet long. It had a body the size of a small car. Its neck was long, or maybe that was its tail. Things smeared together down there, creating an unknowable creature. Painting a monster in broad strokes that I couldn't define in the dim light of the lake. It passed overhead, long and slow. I thought my lungs might burst with how badly they were burning. And then it was gone. I had a clear path to the surface and I took it. I sucked in air loud and frantic. I coughed and I spit and blinked the burning tears from my eyes. The boat wasn't far. I made it back inside somehow. The engine still worked. Before I knew it, I was crawling across the shoreline and laying my face in the mud. I heaved and choked. The motor kept screaming behind me, trying to propel the boat even though it had hit dry land. It must have been twenty minutes before someone found me. They helped me to my feet, uninjured and no worse for wear. At the time, I could only point at the lake. When nothing turned up after that, I became the butt of my friend's jokes. Little by little, my peers stopped taking me seriously. 
All my credibility was gone just because I had seen something that no one else had encountered. I got stuck with the undesirable jobs. Eventually, when I asked my superiors if we could dedicate some manpower to thoroughly searching the lake, I was laughed off the force. I wasn't trained for that either. It hurt. Embarrassment grew in me like a weed. And that weed still sits there. I try telling this story, but no one wants to hear it. These stories always take place on the ground, understand? I guess it's easier to face the idea of a monster in the woods than it is to imagine something lurking beneath the water.